Uh, my name is Matthew Ochoa, and this is my Simon Tech intern presentation. So I did my presentation at uh, Trevor City Heart and Vascular. Um, it's the cardiology group established in Trevor City, and they reach out to places like Cadillac and Gaylord and all over Northern Trevor City, and it's is the largest medical center uh, north of Grand Rapids, I think. Um, so this is the cardiology staff. Um, but some key figures, uh, you have Dr. Ochoa, Dr. Clayton, um, and um, Mr. Carlisle isn't here, but he's also a very important part of the cardiology group. So um, a typical day in the life of me uh, for my internship um, so the day started at 7 o'clock, um, and so on the first day when I got there, I had to take an ethics test um, to make sure that, you know, I don't do anything irrational there, and I have good ethics at the hospital because you need those. Um, but after that, uh, the next step is you go um, into the cardiology center, and then you look over schedule the schedule for the day, um, see what surgeries, what procedures are going to happen, and um, tagging off clients and, and looking over that. Um, then the uh, next step would be uh, we decide or we go to the first scheduled procedure um, and we check in with the patient and make sure that they're doing well and nothing's wrong. You know, nothing happened overnight while they were there because um, if something did, then that would change. You know what what was going on um, and then we explained to them the procedure that was going to happen um, and the 90 percent of the procedures that i watched were um, putting in pacemakers and i'll go into that further um, so you check in with the patient explain to them the procedure what's going to happen and make sure they're comfortable and they're doing all right so once that's done um, you scrub in and that normally takes around five minutes um, because you want to make sure that there are no germs um, from any of the staff that's in the room because if there are that it's an open wound and that can really do a lot on the heart and um, it could really make the person sick and even very fatal. Um, so it normally takes five minutes to scrub in and doctors are not allowed to touch and the nurses have to help them get into their surgical gear. Um, and then, so the pacemaker right here, um, what it is, it is, it is a device that, um, it's a small device implanted in your chest to help control your, uh, like a regular, your irregular heartbeat. So basically if someone is not, if their heart is not strong enough to, like, all the time to keep functioning the way it's supposed to. Uh, this will send small electrical shocks to sort of correct it and keep it on track. Um, and then they have a, a pacemaker um, and they also have a defibrillator, which I'm not sure if it's on here, but it's pretty much the same thing, just larger device, but instead of it only sending like small extra signals to correct the irregular heartbeat, you'll actually do what a defibrillator does and shock the heart. So that way, if someone does have a, go into a heart attack, they have that. Um, and then the next part is, so uh, the device is used is obviously the pacemaker, but then you also have connected are the leads and, and they go into the heart. So you can see here that leads go into the heart. Um, and one of the coolest things that I saw was when they actually, when they put the leads in your heart, they actually have to injure the heart in order to make sure that the leads are in place. Um, and they use that, what they call as a programmer, but it's pretty much a modified EKG machine to, that when you put in the leads in the heart, it, you injure the heart and what they say is great injury when it is one because you need the leads to stay in there and if they don't stay, then the device isn't obviously gonna work correctly. So when they injure it, it sends, the EKG reads it and then they know that the leads are in place. Um, and here's some more pictures of you can see the pacemaker in here, 
and then it's going to do, and yeah, and there's actually another, so there's that, and then sometimes uh, if the person is like, their heart's really unstable, they need a third lead, um, and that procedure can take anywhere from like three hours to five hours, just because that third lead needs to be in like the perfect place in order to support the heart. Um, and yeah, that's, and then once that's done, you finish up the procedure, uh, you close the wound, um, and typically there's a lot of swelling when you close it, um, and the pacemaker just slides it right under, um, and you're not supposed to like take a shower or go anywhere near water because, um, you know, water can't get onto the pacemaker or else it will trip up and that would be very bad. And yeah. And then pretty much repeat that depending on what the next person is. If there's any restraints or anything like that, then you adjust for that. Um, and then after the day's done, uh, it's very, very, very time consuming and uh, it tires you out quickly. Even standing there and watching, I was getting, getting exhausted. So, future plans from this. So, um, I thought it was actually really cool to see how uh, the medical field works and getting a perspective from both uh, nurses and doctors. Um, it really made me think that and going anywhere in the medical field could be really good, um, either whether it's a nurse or becoming a doctor or even such things as like a chiropractor. Uh, my favorite part, so while we were in the uh, operating room, uh, we had a small talk about Barrio because um, it was new, or it was like somewhat new when I was there. And uh, Dr. Carlisle would uh, talk about how good the tacos were, and uh, they're really big whiskey fans in there, so they would talk about also how the whiskey was good. Um, and uh, my favorite part was, so while we were in the operating room, for the first day, um, so we had like some big, uh, and we were mostly dealing with old guys, so they were pretty big, um, but this, and so they would take, you know, not a lot of uh, sediment to pretty much get them get them down and get them settled. But this one lady, we had to uh, give like double the total of everyone else for that day, and she was like small, probably 100 pounds, um, just really, really weak and she just was still fighting. Um, and this was during one of the uh, third leads, um, and you need the person to stay incredibly still so that they don't move, to mess up putting in the lead. And she was wanting to turn and flip and do all that stuff to help out um, the doctor uh, doing the procedure, and he, he was getting really frustrated by it. So that was, it was pretty funny, funny to me. Um, and I would, I would like to give my thanks to uh, Charles A. Arne Baxter, um, especially to uh, Mrs. Fairbank, who would show me part of the nurse side, and then Dr. Ochoa, Dr. Clayton, and Dr. Carl Lau for showing me the doctor side of Charles A. Arne Baxter. I appreciated it. Maybe a good look into my fiance's life. She works in cardiology. Yeah. So I got a little more of an insight there. So thank you. Um, hello, my name is Gus Tuppers, and I did my Cymatech summer internship at Cornerstone Companies. Um, I chose to intern at Cornerstone because I knew that I had interest for science and field work, and I wanted to gain my interest um, for business. Um, I chose to learn more about data, data analytics and how math can be transferred into the business side of the professional world. I was interested to learn how the combination of math and business are um, intertwined. Uh, Cornerstone is a company that guides investors to make strong investments in medical real estate. They get investors to invest in the company. Cornerstone then seeks out buildings to buy or sees buildings to buy from brokers. 
They obtain financial information from building tenants to see their past performance to gauge whether or not buying the property is a proper, profitable investment. When they do buy the when they do buy the building, they receive money when tenants pay rent. The money is then distributed to investors, and the rest of the profit goes to Cornerstone. Uh, Cornerstone was founded 35 years ago and is located in Indianapolis, Indiana. However, there are now remote locations in Kentucky, Ohio, North Carolina, and Michigan, and one of which is in Traverse City. At the Traverse City location, there is a regional property manager and a senior data analyst, and I work under senior data, data analyst, um, Danny Madia. Um, so what is data analytics? Um, it is the analysis of data or statistics. It is used to interpret or, and communicate patterns, trends, and ideas to the company in order to make informed decisions when considering purchasing properties. Uh, data analytics is valuable because there is a constant influx of reported information that needs to be analyzed coming into the company. Um, so others um, can easily interpret it. Analytics relies on the application of statistics, computer programming, and operation research to express data trends. Cornerstone uses analytics to describe, predict, and to improve their business performance to gain higher returns for their investors and for the company. Um, so as you can see here, uh, this is a pipeline spreadsheet. It um, holds all of the influx of information about many different properties. I worked to uh, gather information for the past pipeline tab, um, which uh, is information regarding properties that Cornerstone missed out on. Um, either the broker or the seller of the property decided to go with a different investment company. Um, so then this was analyzed by Danny using complex operations um, and applied math um, to help Cornerstone with future decision making um, when looking to buy a property, whether to not waste their time with the property or to help um, see how the company can improve to gain more, to obtain more properties. this one. Um, so Danny, what I observed was Danny collecting data uh, for past company projects and research it, and he also researches to find new data on existing properties and new business opportunities. He then filters and organizes the data and compiles the information into Excel. He uses equations and applied math in order to interpret the data, making decisions or helping others to make decisions regarding the company's involvement in a certain business venture. He is able to find out the risk or predicted return of buying a property based on how many patients the hospital sees, the technology system the hospital uses, the tenant's ability to pay rent, the length of the leases, the size of the hospital, information on previous owners, type of surgeries they do, what community the building is in, and if it will stay open um, or not in the future. And interpreting this data allows the company to see if they should buy a property or not on behalf of their investors. Um, other than data collection, I was mostly doing file keep up for Cornerstone while observing Danny. As you do need an MBA to work as data analyst for the company, so most of the map was um, out of my skill level. Um, the company, however, had me um, transfer files from Dropbox to Box. Um, they use they compile all their resources um, to complete all tasks and report information into Dropbox. However, um, they were switching to Box because the investment companies that they partner with um, use Box and um, they needed to have it organized to be able to transfer information easier from across company lines. Um, takeaways, the remote office had only two employees working in it. Um, they were sitting at desk from eight to five um, the communication with other team members took place on phone calls, and you had to set up call times prior to calls. I realized that I like face-to-face -face collaboration more, um, because ideas and concerns can be lost in translation over phone calls, and it is harder to work as a team. Um, I also realized I do not have the attention span to sit at a desk um, from 8 to 5. I'd rather be doing... Next, when I was interning, the projects that I observed 
had been worked on for months and were still continuing to be worked on. But I um, understand how the rewards of those projects um, are worth it, but I think that I need smaller projects to not lose interest in my future career. Um, Danny also stressed the importance of learning to navigate Excel for my future career. Um, he explained that he did not get educated in how to navigate and use Excel, and that is, it is important to go out of my way to learn because it can be used in many different careers. Um, and I would like to thank President and Chief Executive Officer Tag Burge for allowing me to do this internship um, in COVID especially, um, when it was especially hard to find an internship. And then I would like to thank Danny Maddy as well for um, mentoring me and letting me um, observe him while I was doing the internship. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, any programming? Did Danny use any programming? Um, he did. He was doing a lot of research when I was there to um, figure out um, new programming strategies and new operations. Cool. To use. All right. Hi. My name is Colin Gordon, and I did my summer internship at Travers Area Community Sailing. So Traverse Area Community Sailing <clears throat> was founded in 1994, and basically this group of people came together who really wanted to share the love of sailing for just the community around here, because you know, we're surrounded by fresh water, and it's a great activity that not a lot of people think to do or think they have access to, and this place really gives um, an opportunity to people to sail affordably, um, Really, the main focus is getting youth involved with sailing, excited about sailing. So we have youth programs throughout the summer, maybe five of them, they're two-week sessions. There's a session in the morning and a session in the afternoon. They're about three hours per day. So people can drop their kids off and they can come have fun here at Tax. And most of the instructors also are high schoolers from here or West or St. Francis who, uh, you know, benefit alongside the children through the teaching, um, just kind of the teaching skills that you develop by working with these younger kids and teaching them something that you, you know, I'm very passionate about sailing, so I was uh, very happy to teach kids about this and involve them with this thing that I love so much. So scientific integration, I normally work here during the summer, so I really did have to switch it up to make it more science related. Sailing in itself is kind of scientific, but I really wanted to take it a step further. So in a normal day, we would go out, uh, everyone meets up, we do stretches in the morning, and we get the kids ready, they, you know, they rig their boats, they learn a new skill each day, go out and have fun, play some games. But what I did instead, um, did all the same stuff in the morning, you know, everyone met at this group, but then my group separated off of it, and instead of focusing on more sailing-related things, we did some science around the water and around sailing, like more directed science, like uh, wind speed and sail measurements, and we even did some water testing towards the end, so I thought that was very fun, um, because, you know, the kids that I taught were all, they'd all been there before, so they all knew at least the basics of sailing. Um, so I just took a little bit of extra time, kept the kids off the water for a little longer, and taught them some more things, because what I, what I basically had to do with this, um, my boss gave me a book that was a curriculum for a program. There's not a picture of it up here, but it was a pretty thick book, a curriculum that could be taught in schools where, you know, if I had maybe the two weeks with one session, like seven hours a day, I might have gotten through it all. So really what I had to do was take the important parts of the stuff that I think could really be applied here and put it into what I taught each day. And I had that recorded. So, I mean, that's what I did 
and my favorite part, I think, is right here. Uh, towards the end, we did some water testing in Boardman because there has been some questionable things that have happened with Boardman Lake. I think there was a sewage leak uh, a while back that was, you know, it always smells bad because there's a sewage treatment plant, so we wanted to see if the water was really gross or not. And we tested um, different parts of the water, different, uh, as you can see, maybe, which one is the point, which one's the loser? Anyways, uh, on the paper that I wanted to fill out, we did like a southwest corner, a southeast corner, northwest corner, northeast corner of the lake to see if it was uh, changed throughout what, um, the different things that we tested. And then we did uh, some groundwater, so compared to like normal drinking water. Um, so the temperature stayed the same, but the main things we tested, we tested the specific gravity, which we had some things on Amazon to do, so that was fun, uh, pH, and uh, percent transmittance, which if you go back here, we have those devices right there, which were supplied by a teacher over at St. Francis and John LaCrosse, because my boss is actually also a teacher at St. Francis. So he got these things, they're mass spectrometers, um, but we, you know, they can be used to measure like the isotopes of atoms and see atomic weight, but I use them in a way to get like the percent transmittance to see if there was anything irregular from, like, from water to see like kind of how light transmitted through the water, see if there's any cloudiness or anything besides water that was in the way. Um, in this, uh, on the side, you can see some, these are like pool testing kits that we use with Boardman. This is how we got the pH readings. Um, the, biggest, the biggest thing that was different for Boardman compared to regular water was it had a very high pH level compared to drinking water. It was sort of closer to 8.4 or 9. It went higher than the actual reading. I thought that was pretty interesting. It's just like the mineral content around the lake likely that caused that. Um, overall, I really did enjoy working here. You know, the teaching in itself was kind of science to me. You know, in its own regard, it uh, takes a lot of skills that you have to foster over time to, you know, efficiently teach people different skills and like kind of show your enthusiasm to it, like keep people engaged because that's really what we were trying to do this whole time. So there's obviously the scientific aspect of um, what I was teaching the kids, but that was more basic. I really enjoyed the science of you know, teaching itself. So for my acknowledgments, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Ben Ferris. He's the head instructor. He is, you know, I think he's, he's a ski coach. He does, he does a lot of stuff. He's a teacher at St. Francis. He's a Spanish teacher over there during the school year, and he runs tax over the summer. Uh, John Cross for supplying the mass spectrometers. My coworker, Grant Miller, who's actually a student here. All the other tax volunteers that helped out, you know, everything, you know, everyone really does make an effort to like make this community work, get everything moving. Everyone is very active. I really like it. Um, and ben Ferris always like never ceases to amaze me. He's very good at his job. He's been teaching for a long time, and there's always so much to learn from him. I can, you know, I can always go in. He will have a way to keep these kids engaged, keep them enthusiastic about sailing, and it's just something I really want to develop within my own life, that kind of skill. All right, thank you for listening. Any questions? Can I uh, hire you to come in? Do some lessons? What'd you say? Can I hire you to come in and do some lessons? <laughs> Maybe. Oh, sounds awesome. Very cool stuff. Thank you. Uh, my name is Grady. Uh, I did my uh, summer internship at Promethean Incorporated, uh, which is a company uh, designed, they started in 2012 and they design direct thermoelectric heating and cooling devices. They manage heat by conduction rather than convection like traditional HVAC systems and use uh, Peltier modules, which you can see in this diagram right here. Uh, the way it works is by absorbing heat uh, from this surface and transferring it to this surface for dissipation with a cooling fan. It can also work backwards simply by reversing the current flow and pump heat from this surface to this surface to act as a heating system. 
So it works exactly like, the, like an air conditioning unit by simply transferring heat from one surface to another, except it's easily reversible and has no moving parts, as well as no refrigerant or anything like that. To transfer the heat uh, from the cooled surface or the heated surface here uh, to the surface of whatever you're trying to cool, in, this case, in most cases Promethean works with seating surfaces, they use graphene over here. Graphene is a, a material made entirely of carbon atoms arranged in a flat molecular structure. Um, and it is m many times more heat conductive than copper while still remaining thin, flexible, and lightweight, making an ideal choice for seating surfaces where anything else would be uh, an obstruction to sitting on. They work primarily in the transportation sector uh, with uh, motorcycles, boats, trains, planes, buses, as well as many other endeavors, as well as they're investigating future uh, involvement in furniture, as well as garments. As you can see up on the upper right, uh, one of their early clients was Indian Motorcycles, who uses their system in their climate command seat, uh, which is a heated seat and cooled seat uh, for both passengers on some of their luxury bikes. You can option that in. And on the lower right, you can see CEO uh, Bill Myers standing next to a tour bus seat, just like you'd see on any tour bus, um, which has the modules installed in it for having heating and cooling. They mostly use it for demoing, uh, for people curious about the technology. Uh, but it's a great example of you know, how this technology could be used in uh, the tour bus industry should that. While I was there, they were working on designing the system to function in marine applications. Uh, and had a couple of boat manufacturers who were interested in implementing it. That's uh, heating and cooled seats on the water. As well as uh, starting to investigate the possibility of large-scale large scale stadium applications. While I was there, my task was to design an, Ar an Arduino-controlled circuit to control one of their thermoelectric engines. Uh, that started by simple manual button control, just tap the button, system turns on, and then work up to controlling with a PC serial monitor, and then dedicated app control over Bluetooth. Uh, in addition, I was asked to provide a helping hand when necessary, um, but mostly I worked on my project. As I was working on it, they, the staff came up with a few other things that they were hoping for me to add, such as a temperature monitoring via thermistor, so that different heater set points could be set so the system would only heat to a certain point and then cut off. In addition, they were hoping that I could program a way for it to be fault tolerant, so if, if for example, the cooling fan failed, the system would shut down rather than allowing the heat sink to become too saturated uh, with heat from the module. Here is a diagram of the circuit that I built. There's a lot going on here, but the most important, the most important parts are all labeled with these kind of labels. The fan thermistor and module all have to do with the thermoelectric engine cooling system itself. So these are all contained in the module but separate on the diagram for illustration purposes. These two buttons control the system manually and this light tells you what mode the system is in, which I'll get to in a second. You can see when it turns on, it prompts you in the serial monitor as to what buttons you can push to make things happen. And you can see I just hit the cool button, the fan is on, cooling the heatsink, the module is cooling, we're in cooling mode, and it reports up here that the system is cooling. Turned it off and now it will switch to heating here in one second. You can see the system mode light is on, but before I dialed the thermistor, the module status light was off, meaning it was ready to heat, except that the thermistor was indicating the temperature too high to actually heat. So you can see as I dial it up right here, the module status light goes out, but the system mode light is still on, indicating when the temperature drops, it will come back in. You can see I just changed the mode, which changed the set point, which kicked the heater back in. This will happen one more time. There's three, in this programming, this is just how I did it, there's many ways. The programming, there's three different levels of heat. This one is set to 40, 60, and 80 degrees Celsius. Um, you can also add um, different modes of cooling, but I unfortunately didn't have the hardware to do that because it requires transistors to 
lower the voltage to the module. You can also input things into the serial monitor, which I'm about to do, to activate the system. And in one second, it'll pop up right there saying the heater's on. So this was part two of the project, just so I could control it from a computer. Works the same way, but you can use that instead of the buttons. And then as far as the Bluetooth app is concerned, it interfaced the same way, but just had a different skin on the app. But that was the goal. Unfortunately, the app, the custom app builder that I was using would not interface with the Bluetooth module that they gave me. My favorite and least favorite parts of the internship, my favorite part was the project focus, not presence focused nature of the job. Whereas a lot of jobs are just simply relying on you being there on the off chance that they might have someone come in or someone that needs help. I was constantly, always had something to do and was working on this project whenever I wasn't helping somebody in the lab. The other thing I liked was the social working environment. Casual conversation was encouraged and I was able to get to know the people that I was working with as well as sort of learn their stories and what they liked about working there and other places they could work. The other thing, another thing, I was working on separate projects and the company of people working towards a common goal. Meaning, I was working alone at my own pace, but if I needed group help with debugging or just group support on the project, that was available without the constant, you know, checking back in with people on group projects. Lastly, this was the largest programming project I had ever worked on, so I was able to gain an incredible amount of experience that I would not have had otherwise. What didn't go so well was when the Arduino suddenly died with no warning. It was really annoying because none of us could figure out why, and so I spent several hours trying to figure out if it could be revived, and as did some of the other people in the lab. And none of us could figure out what had happened to it or why it died. And that was unfortunate because I didn't know what I did wrong, so there was no way for me to learn from my mistakes. And it sent me back a couple days because I had to wait for another person to remember to bring theirs in. Uh, another problem was some of the hardware was uh, not interfacing very well with the software. So the, challenge, the mentally taxing challenges were strong in this one, as you'd fix one problem and it would appear to be fixed, but it would break again and things like that. Similar, similarly, there's many variables of it not functioning. You know, it could be something as simple as forgetting a semicolon or leaving a wire loose, which I did a bunch of times. Or it could be as complex as having the wrong component or something like that, and you just never know. And so you'll, you'll solve the problem multiple times again. And the last thing that didn't go so well is that my custom app wouldn't interface with the Bluetooth module that I had. Um, so I wasn't able to get the custom app working, so I ended up having to use just a Bluetooth serial controller, which worked, um, but wasn't as pretty as I was hoping it was going to be. I'd like to thank Chris Hardy, the business manager at Promethean, for providing me with this opportunity, as well as working with my complex scheduling. I would like to thank Jordan Colvin, the lab tech at Promethean, who helped me whenever I was stuck, and he was the predominant person that I worked with. Thank you to Dave, the electrical engineer at Promethean. I wish I had his last name, but I don't. Um, he was always willing to help me debug some of the electronics, such as transistors, that I hadn't had experience with, as well as loaning me his oscilloscope. And then thank you to the rest of the Promethean team for being so accommodating and patient with me and giving me the inside look at a startup company. Any questions? Is this, some, is this the type of thing you want to do in your career? It gave me a great, a great look. I'm not sure if electrical, I was predominantly doing electrical and computer engineering here. That is not my most interested topic. I'm more mechanical. Um, but I did really like the experience of learning what it's like to be in that startup company environment, um, you know, and what that entails. But I, I could certainly go into the mechanical part of this company or something like it. Awesome. Yeah, I know. Everything mechanic now gets to be electrical as well. So, <laughs> good stuff. Thank you. So, I did my internship at the Michigan League of Conservation Motors. MLCB, as I'll refer to it, is an organization that wants to protect Michigan's land, air, and water. And they do this through political outreach, 
on the state and local level, as well as environmental science research and law. So my responsibilities were very diverse. I actually did this internship virtually for three months. So I started out organizing community events and eventually leading them, such as phone banks and trainings and um, town halls for people to learn more about environmental issues. I also attended trainings on environmental issues and sustainability here in Michigan. And I represented MLCV at outside events, such as a town hall with Four Local Water and other law organizations. And that image is from an interview that I did um, about my experience with the internship. So having to summarize all of my experience into that project as well. So a day in the life, um, as I said, is very diverse. But in general, we would log into the Zoom meeting. Um, you would check in with the daily schedule, what you were supposed to do for the day, who you were supposed to call if you were doing phone banks. So you would either create your own phone bank list um, in the van or voter activation network, which that's an example of what a phone bank looks like when it's done. Um, like the drop down menu for if you're scheduling somebody, um, or you can use the existing phone bank. And then you're calculating the results of the phone bank and projecting how it will go based on how many people you want to attend. You would also make phone calls out of that script or attend a training and prepare for events. If you just want to pause for a little bit. If you want to pause and let folks come in. And then when you start, just give a quick summary of what you've done. And then just continue on. Cool. I just go fast. logging into the Zoom meeting and checking our daily schedule of what we were supposed to do for the day, 
Um, and we would spend a lot of time making phone calls because, as I'll talk about later, you have to calculate how many people you actually want to attend the event and multiply that exponentially to actually how many phone calls you have to make. Um, so we would either create phone bank lists ourselves or get uh, phone bank lists already created. This picture is from the application we used called the VAN, the Voter Activation Network. Um, and it's also pretty representative of what my computer screen would look like where I have my Google Calendar, a bunch of phone bank lists, and a slideshow of um, training scripts. And if uh, we weren't making phone calls, we were either doing trainings or preparing for events that we were leading. So the tools of community organizing were the VAN, as I mentioned, the Voter Activation Network. It holds all of our supporter information, our phone bank lists, our um, past and current event information, and it's sort of our big database for all, anything that we need. We also have training scripts and slides. So up here I have the community norm slide, which would be one that we present at every event. Um, and you just have your speaker notes below that you kind of reference and present to the community. You also have a Google Doc of the phone bank script, so kind of the behind the scenes flow of information depending on what people say. It's much more user friendly when people are actually in the van, but you also have this behind the scenes. And of course, Zoom meetings was very helpful because that was how I conducted my internship. So the PFAS session, as I mentioned, was with Four Love of Water, or Flow, and the mayor of Trevor City. And our goal was to change EGLE, the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy, change their notification process for PFAS contamination. Because people were found to have PFAS in their drinking water but weren't alerted for months afterwards. And of course, this would be a problem um, ethically and scientifically. So, my slides that I worked on were the Stay Involved and the What Can You Do slides. You can see me up in the corner. Um, I basically focus on how to identify PFAS visually in water, how to test for water, how to test your water for PFAS, and how to get involved with organizations and stay updated. I also led people to call the director of EGLE. So we had over 50 voicemails left for the director of EGLE to change the notification process because of this event. So there are many career and major connections from this internship because it was so interdisciplinary and focused on community organizing and environmental science. Um, for me, I'm most interested in environmental policy as a career choice, perhaps environmental law, or doing research on environmental impacts and acting as a consultant for different companies or um, organizations. So STEM connections, as I've said, there's this undercurrent of community organizing that we had to put these things into effect. But we did have to understand the details of PFAS testing in the community and calculate rates of phone banks. Like I mentioned, this would be, for every person you call, there's a 33% chance that they're going to actually answer the phone. And then one in the people who answer are going to answer your questions. Roughly one in four are going to say yes. And then about half of those people who said yes are actually going to show up. So you have you want an event of a good size, you have to call hundreds of people. And that was why we spent so much time phone banking and how we had to calculate our results in advance. Um, and we also used the work of environmental scientists, of course, to inform our decisions. Um, the latest research on climate change and the Great Lakes to call our politicians and ask them to support certain bills. And I often acted as tech support on our phone banks because many of our volunteers are older and the combination of Zoom meetings and Google Docs and the voter activation network was really a struggle for a lot of them. So I had a lot of takeaways from this. Again, this is such an interdisciplinary field of work, meaning that you take so many different um, areas of expertise and put them together to tackle this big challenge of climate change. So you have to be strong in both STEM, understanding the science and the logic behind it, as well as community organizing and distilling that scientific information down to the public. So communication is key. I have it here with my peers, supervisors, attendees, but also from the scientific community down to everyday people. It's really important to actually bring forward to emphasize the human connections of the work that we're doing. And finally, um, policy decisions should be informed by sound scientific evidence. So I have a picture of the U.S. Capitol right now because they're debating climate policy, but this happens on every level. We need to ensure that we're considering the future impacts of our decisions from a variety of lens. So thank you to Caitlin Flynn, who introduced me to NLCB, 
and interviewed me for this competitive internship, and to Natalie Hayes and Abigail Barker, who were my supervisors and led us through this whole process. Hi, my name is Julia Flynn, and I did my summer internship at Structure and Function Chiropractic. Um, it is a chiropractic office in downtown Traverse City. Uh, the, the chiropractor working there is Dr. Funk. He is also the wrestling coach here at TC Central. Okay, so why I chose Structure and Function. So initially, I was actually a patient there. Um, late spring of this year, uh, so I'm a runner. Okay, I'll start there. I'm a runner for Traverse City Central. I do cross country and I do track. Um, and in late spring, I had some sharp pain in my left foot, like the upper tendons in my left foot. And so I went to the office and I had an appointment and Dr. Fung explained my injury. And it was really fascinating because within like just a couple of minutes, he told me like the probable causes of my injury. He knew exactly like what tendons in my foot were irritated. And then he also explained to me how to like recover from that as quickly as possible. So I thought that was really fascinating that someone could just over a span of like a few minutes could like explain to me exactly what was wrong. Um, and then because I was kind of stumped of what was happening to me, so it was really refreshing to be like, oh, it's really simple. So um, I asked him after my appointment if I could intern over the summer, and he said yes. Um, and so that's just more about my injury. He said he diagnosed it as a mental and somatic dysfunction of the lower extremity, which basically means that my muscles and joints movements were not coordinating correctly. Okay, so role in the office. Um, Okay, so <laughs> my role as an intern was to shadow the various workers at Structure and Function, observe how day-to-day -day work is completed, and learn how private practice runs. So, like, a day in the life would be, in the morning, I would observe a few chiropractic appointments with Dr. Funk. Um, it was really surprising me how quickly his job moved. There, like, the, um, the appointments typically lasted 15 minutes, and... He has over 4,000 patients, so it was really surprising to me that when each patient would come in, Dr. Funk was very personable. He would, he knew like the background of every patient and just continued on like a, a very nice conversation and made the patients feel very comfortable while they were at the appointment. So with over 4,000 patients, that was very impressive, and it showed me that like a big part of being a doctor, in addition to knowing how like being well practiced in your field, like you need to be approachable and you need to have a relationship with your patient that is that is comfortable. Um, and so the patients, like that was one of my favorite parts of the internship was just being able to talk with the many different patients. Like I saw like probably 50 patients during my whole entire internship or more actually. Um, and so a lot of them asked if I was interested in chiropractic work myself and they thought I was in college and in the medical field and I was like no I'm just doing an internship um, but then later on in the afternoon I typically um, like my um, role typically shifted towards like manning the front desk with Miss Rudiger she um, which like that, that part of my day included a lot of filing and filing like new patient files for people that were just becoming new patients and I had to like organize their information as well as like retrieving information from existing accounts. Um, and in addition, like Dr. Funk was not only the chiropractor, he, he owns the whole entire practice. So he owns the private practice and he's in charge of everything that goes on and like he said like per month he has to pay like $20,000 just to keep his practice running. Um, so there's a lot of other duties that go into Dr. Funk's work, and it was really um, eye-opening for me to just see, like, in addition to his role as a chiropractor, his job did then there. Um, and then, so in the later afternoon time, I typically observe massage appointments with Ms. Lisa, and she's a Michigan licensed massage therapist. So her room kind of reminded me of a spa. It was very zen and it, it smelled like um, essential oils. It was very calming. And massage therapy provided a key role in increasing blood circulation, reducing swelling, relaxing muscles, 
relieving muscle spasms, and then also aided in recovery and range of motion. Patients that saw her would typically go to the massage appointment with her, and then they would see Dr. Funk afterwards. And that was a really good combo for a lot of patients because they would relax their muscles, and then they would go into Dr. Funk's office, and they would get adjusted. And <laughs> that part of the internship was actually kind of my least favorite, um, was just being in the room when they were getting adjusted, because sometimes it was a little, like, scary or, like, startling because, like, I mean, he like, go crack their neck, and, you know, you don't know if he's going to do it wrong or not. I mean, it's not a joke. I don't think. It was scary. <laughs> for me, at least. Um, but it was really satisfying to see, like, patients just walk out of the building and feel better. A lot of them felt a lot of relief from the tension that was building up. Um, another cool thing was all the patients that would come in, a lot of them had just very different backgrounds and very different jobs and lifestyles. And uh, a lot of them had very similar issues. Like a lot of them had back pain and like lower back pain or neck tension. And it seemed like from very different causes, a lot of patients had very similar issues. And so a lot of the... Um, appointments were a lot of the same adjustments. So it was kind of very routine and I got, like with the short appointments, you saw a lot of the repetition and rigor that was in Dr. Funk's job because it was, it was just in and out, like a lot of patients, a lot of patients, and then just kind of routine things. Um, I'm going to switch the slide here. So technology in the office. So Ms. Rudiger at the front desk also took the time to explain Chirotech, or Chirotech, I keep messing that up. <laughs> Um, it's a cloud-based electronic medical file, EMR, software program. Uh, Chiro Touch um, is responsible for Dr. Funk's scheduling, electronic medical files, billing, electronic sending of claims, detection of claim errors, and di displaying the daily appointments. Um, so it was a pretty advanced program. However, it was very user-friendly because like, I had to kind of learn how it worked and then also how to use it at the front desk. And... By the end of my internship, I pretty much had a handle on it. Um, so, key takeaways. Um, so, in addition, like, from the program of Chirotech, billing and reception, business management, and chiropractic for itself, I learned so much at my, from my time at Structure and Function. And the Cymatech application um, between math, science, and technology to Dr. Funk's job in the, at the office is built my enthusiasm even more for Cymatech classes at Central High School, as well as my interest in a future in STEM. And then acknowledgments, I would like to thank Dr. Funk for allowing me to have this great opportunity of a 45-hour internship. It was super fun for the most part, sometimes a little boring, but <laughs> for the most part, it was really informative, and I loved it. And thank you to Ms. Rudiger for just helping me understand Cairo Touch and just really, like, I got to know her as well, like, really well during the internship. We talked a lot, and she was a very interesting person. And then Ms. Lisa for like, allowing me to observe the uh, massage appointments. So uh, that is all for my internship. Any questions? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Was it like 45 hours, like just one week and then you were done? So I, I tried to be like pretty productive. Like I, um, this internship could take course of like throughout the whole of summer. So like, let's see like what my scheduling was like. I kind of cranked it out like right after the last day of school and I got it done within probably like mm, five days. So, I mean, yeah, I took some pretty long hours because I just wanted to click through it, but it was really informative and I really enjoyed it, but also I wanted to continue with just having a break and going on to my summer, so it was really nice. So my summer internship was with the Amalgamated Specialty Group. So it's, uh, it's actually based in Maryland, but I was working with a local vice president, um, I was working with them virtually. Uh, so it's Mr. John Huber, he's the Vice President of Technology and Digital Commerce. Um, so he was working with, you know, a lot of, trying to use some of this more modern technology to look at what their, you know, their insurance data and everything. Um, so they mostly focus on small business commercial tax insurance, uh, which is a little obscure, but it was, you know, it's, the contents are pretty similar. 
So what I was doing was using Tableau, which is a data analytics software, um, to take some of his raw data and turn it into things that are more presentable. So as a vice president, he was uh, you know, working with other people in the company. Um, you know, and so what I, was, a lot of what I was doing was taking some of this raw data, making it into things he could actually use to show other members of the company. So the biggest thing I did was a project I was connecting policy yield over time. So as an insurance company, you give out policy quotes, which, you know, if somebody asks you, okay, how much is it going to cost to insure this taxi? Um, but, you know, not everybody's going to actually get a policy. And so on top of just the amount of actual policies you get in a given amount of time, what Mr. Neiman really wanted me to focus on was, okay, we don't want to waste our agent's time, right? So we want to find the best time of the year where we're going to actually get the most policies for the amount of time we're putting in. Um, and so one of the ways I did that with Tableau, and actually it was not, I couldn't use any of the data for anything like this because it was all um, you know, private data. So it's just an example of what you can do on Tableau. So kind of, let's see if I can get this. But uh, so I essentially made a little formula that would calculate the yield based off the amount of policies and the amount of quotes in a given amount of time. Um, so I was mostly focusing on months. So then I would, you know, kind of compare that data over time and see, you know, what months would be the best time to, um, you know, to invest in marketing or advertisements and like that. Because like I said, you know, the amount of policy you get is important, but ultimately they want to be effective with the amount of time that their agents are putting in into creating quotes and stuff. Um, so kind of my connections. The school was, you know, last year I took AP stats, so I was able to kind of look at this data, and, you know, it was very, you know, it was obviously just like thousands of numbers and things that are hard to look at, and so that's kind of where Tableau came into play, was being able to organize that data into something that's more useful. Um, so kind of with what I learned in class was I was able to look at, you know, look at the data and be like, okay, here's, you know, two months, you can't really make a big connection there, but if you're able to look at the data over a few years, and kind of you know, boil that down to you know what months, what times of the year are going to be the most effective for advertising, um, and then kind of for the future, you know, data anal analytics, especially now with the accessibility of things like Tableau, which you know I had to teach my, you know, Mr. Deaver helped me learn it, but most of it was kind of teaching myself with the data he was providing me. Um, you know, it's fairly accessible considering the high school is able to do it in 45 hours. Um, so, you know, with the accessibility of this data, data analytics software, you know, it, data analysis is really used in every field of study. And I personally want to go into some sort of engineering, but even then, you know, being able to look at, you know, you, you need data really to do anything practical, right? So, you know, there's no, like, for, you know, in this case, right, the you know, data was super important to be able to know what kind of things are worth investing in and, Kind of, you know, all the stuff I talked about earlier. So, you know, data analyst analytics is super important in every field of study. So, in, you know, even kind of in my day-to-day -day life, being able to look at data and think about how to make connections between it, because when you have you know hundreds of categories of data and thousands of data points, it's kind of hard to it's, it can be pretty intimidating to look at. And so, I kind of learned, okay, here's some common connections you can make, kind of like the policy yield. Right, so I, you know, was, you might look at the data and be like, okay, what am I going to do with all this random sales data? But what I learned was, okay, I can make it and compare it versus the quotes and policies and make it into something more meaningful. Um, yeah, so that's kind of some of my takeaways there is kind of understanding it. And so over here is kind of the process that I took of, you know, you kind of figure out what your need is and then look at what you have. And so I was able to do that and just kind of learn about, okay, here's what I need to do. And in the case of needing to make presentations to, for my boss to look to present to his fellow VPs or anybody, you know, it's kind of, okay, he needed, so he'd give me an assignment of, okay, I need to analyze what times of the year are best to invest in marketing. And so that's kind of where the, the policy yield came into play and saying, okay, I need to make this into something that's presentable or 
people who aren't looking at the data all the time because you know most people don't want to spend hours looking at data they just want to see okay here's a graph and um here's what i can do with it so some of my acknowledgments obviously my boss mr john niebuhr you know he didn't he spent a lot of time with me and i provided you with all this private data which is I'm not sure but it was you know, a lot to give to a teenager and obviously allowing me to take part in this business you know he's very busy and everything and then of course thank you to mr Barron. you know he's been super helpful throughout the years being in the cybertech program and i think i can speak for all the seniors that we're going to miss him and that we're really looking forward to our last few days and spending as much time with him as we can so thank you any questions Interesting stuff. You're doing things that I was doing. My first cover job after college, so you're much more accelerated than me. <coughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. This summer, I interned for the Grand Traverse Regional Land Conservancy. So it's a locally. Oh, I thought one of the pictures did not. It's a locally based organization out of Grand Traverse County that services about five counties around the area that was founded about 30 years ago in 1991. So far they've protected over 40,000 acres of land and 150 miles of shoreline. And for this I did a number of tasks, so I'm going to be describing about the three different tasks I was doing over my 45 hours. The first of which was executive shadowing. So this culminated in late June, where I shadowed the executive director, Mr. Glenn Chow, and the farmland program coordinator, Ms. Laura Regan, Laura Regan. And for that, we met with our U.S. Senator, Debbie Stabenow, out on the Leelanau Peninsula to uh, discuss the regional implications of something she passed in the 2014 Agricultural Bill, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And that gives federal funding to organizations like the Land Conservancy to buy uh, development rights from landowners and to fund conservation projects to save local ecosystems. So for this, we met out on the uh, Grand Traverse Regional Band of Ottawa Chippewa Indians Reservation out there for the first stop, and that was a uh, project where they helped save a stream bed that was funded by this program. And the next was a place bought uh, conserved by the Leelanau Regional Land Conservancy, a farm where they purchased the uh, development rights, which allowed this property to be sold to another family from the other owners without it having any threat of being developed later. So this showed me how the government helps with environmental policy and how conservation just works in general, like purchasing uh, the development rights so that private owners can sell to other private owners without there being any threat of development happening later. The second thing I did was invasive species removal. So this happened out mostly at the Green Dunes Natural Area, which is a little bit north of the Arcadia Dunes Preserve. For this, we had to remove spotted knapweed, which is the picture of that flower over there. It's a very invasive plant. I think it came from Europe. And it, is, uh, it takes over ecosystems very fast, and it suppresses native species. So for this, I had to learn how to remove, identify, and properly dispose of the spotted knapweed. And this is important for local ecosystems preserve, to preserve native plants and to uh, maintain the conservancy properties and to keep, uh, yeah, just make them so they're not overly, uh, there's not like weeds everywhere. The final thing I did for this was property maintenance and construction. So in the pictures I put up there happened out in the Embayment Lakes Preserve, which was a newly purchased conservancy property. We had to remove an outhouse and some stairs from an old hunting enclave that was out there that the cabins had already been demolished. And this is to help cut on costs for conservancy maintenance so they don't have to maintain cabins and other things. It also helps reduce liability and to protect people who might go to the park so they don't try and go off the trail and investigate these dangerous, like, rotting stairs. And the next thing for maintenance and construction was we had to build trails on some new uh, properties, one of which was out by Torch Lake. 
and that involves you know scraping off a couple inches of organic material from material from the surface of the earth, and it also involved you know leveling some embankments to prevent erosion from happening. So I had to understand exactly what to do to prevent the trails from just being completely uh, washed away in the event of rain. So all very important things for maintaining properties and making them a good place for the public to come visit. And yes, and for acknowledgments, I would like to thank John Thorpe, who was the event and volunteer coordinator. He helped me uh, uh, find all the places they wanted me to go out and to uh, get me in contact with the people I'd be working with. Mr. Glenn Chown, who was the executive director, he accepted my internship and so graciously allowed me to uh, shadow him for a day. And that was a very, that was something I didn't expect going into this internship. And it was an amazing experience. Same with Laura Regan, she helped teach me about the Regional Conservation Partnership Program and how the government helps uh, with conservation. And then Brenna, Anula, Paula Dreesen, and Erica Desjardins, I was working with them out in the field. They, were, they showed me how to identify invasive species and they helped me with removing and dealing with the property maintenance and construction. Are there any questions? So my Sabotag presentation was with Cunningham Limp, which is a construction business company based in Novi, but also has a sub-office in Traverse City. So Cunningham Limp does construction projects, both commercial and smaller scale, throughout the United States of America, but they specifically focus on Michigan. And their new reach, their new goals, is to be in Traverse City, which they believe is a, a growing community with a lot of opportunity. So tasks and activities in my internship at Cunningham Wimp when I spent the 45 hours in July, usually I get there in the morning at around nine or so and my supervisor, Jerry Tomzak, would have a, a civil engineering plan laid out at the desk I was seeing and he'd ask me what are three questions or three observations I have from looking at this drawing and then I would go and tell him and usually this drawing would relate to an activity he had me doing during the day. So usually I would look at this drawing, give him my observations, and then we would usually go and visit what that drawing came from. So the drawings were for job sites for the projects. It would be like an upper floor level and the specs for the projects, like here's the windows, here's the doors, here's the bearings. And then we would go and visit that job site. Here's one such job site out in Glen Arbor. This is just a picture of some posts and a chimney, but I chose this because, is there a laser, is there a laser pointer on this? Yeah, it's the red thing above the. Okay, because on civil engineering plans, everything has to be laid out perfectly for the company and for liability reasons, because there's a building code book, and if not, if everything isn't in, in perfect, there can be thousands of dollars of fines incurred, and it's a messy situation, then everyone Cunningham Limp they work with, they work with subcontractors and the owners. The owners are not going to be pleased if the chimney is in the wrong spot or if the bearings don't hold up. So everything has to be done with a high level of scrutiny and make sure everything is in place, a place for everything. Um, so materials and tools I used, and here's an actual picture of a site drawing plan. You can see the bearings and the like inches, the specs, to make sure everything's in place. But materials and tools I used, we use a lot of Excel, Google Excel, for help with spreadsheets, for budgeting, and for planning. So their budgets would usually be in the neighborhoods of like 10 to 12 million dollars. So everything had to be organized and be able to relate to each other. So they used a lot of Excel to organize it, to columnize it, because on the budgets, they have to account for paying subcontractors, they have to account for materials, they have to account for supply chain, which was a huge, a huge issue when I went. The supply chain was really backed up, so they had, for one such project, they had order, ordered a door, a glass door, for um, a new restaurant they were building, and the door was six months behind, and you can see that causes some problems for opening day, and for just 
how the owner, the owner relations, how the owner might feel if the project is far behind. They also used Google Calendar to set up meets with architects and owners and subcontractors. So everything, they had weekly meetings with the owners of the, of the projects they were working on at Cunningham Land, which I sat in on. Um, weekly meetings to make sure everything was going well, the owner was pleased, any questions the owner had, to make sure there was absolute transparency and that Cunningham Limp, as a construction business company, was doing everything in their power to make sure that the project was running smoothly on time and as the owner wished. They also used a specialized program called Plan Grid, which directly relates to the STEM applications because it helps house the civil engineering plans. It's kind of if you guys have taken CAD, computer aided design, and I think, is that a freshman or sophomore class? What year did they take CAD? Sophomore. Sophomore, well, I mean, sophomores are taking CAD. It's kind of like that. You, you drag the things, you make shapes, and you make 3D drawings and 2D drawings so that the owner and the subcontractors, tractors, and everyone on the actual job site, the construction workers building it, knows exactly where to put everything so that the structure doesn't collapse when people first step in it because it's not built correctly. So time management, how about a day is spent in micro and macro management of resources and contractors. Everything they do at Cunningham Blimp relates to another subset. So everything that has to be done relies on other people or other resources. Like I was saying about the supply chain, the, if something's behind, that sets off the people who are lined up to work at a specific time. That sets off the opening day. That sets off the owner's plans. So everything has a chain domino reaction and you have to manage resources and contractors with high levels of just involvement. Here's a picture of two of my, two of the people I worked with. This is Zach and Jerry. We were looking at a job site and specifically a wetland. And one important thing when building is wetland delineation. You can't build on a wetland, otherwise really bad things happen. You get sued and the structure is not structurally sound. Um, so we were checking to make sure I don't know, the flags were in place and that the owner did, was, had not, did not have plans to build on a wetland. So ethics and expectations in the construction business environment um, Cunningham Wimp had a motto of building better communities, and they were all about the ethical treatment of owners and contractors. And for ethics in relation to cybertech in general, um, when working with a subcontractor, you can't, like, obviously you can't play a, a round of golf with them out of the books, you can't buy them dinner, anything to persuade them to maybe take your job and to help you out instead of another company. And to make sure that you're not, when you make, when you build a budget for a project, you're not leaving out certain materials and taking shortcuts that will allow the project to look like it's more efficient, but actually you're gonna to have to add those in later, and it's gonna be a big issue for everyone involved. Acknowledgements, I want to thank my supervisor and project manager at uh, Cunningham Lynn, Jerry Tomzak. He was the one who mainly worked with me every day, who came in, who took me to job sites to look at everything and get first hand on, like, hands on experience. I also want to thank Zach, he's in this picture. Um, he was the civil engineer at Cunningham Lynn, and his job was to make sure that the civil engineer, he was job to make sure all the plans and drawings were correct and that everything was up to date, and he would go out and visit a job site probably four times a week to make sure all the contractors were on task and doing what they were supposed to do, and that the project was running smoothly. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, my name is Drew Humphrey. I interned at Tier of Phoenix Aesthetics over the summer. Uh, it was a really cool opportunity for me because I was kind of in between medical and engineering and just kind of combined both of them. There wasn't a lot of technology that I was working with, but it was very hands-on, which was awesome. Uh, so I thought I'd just kind of go through what I did at the beginning of my internship and what I was doing by the end of it. So in the beginning, uh, I met all the team members, which was really cool. 
Um, they were all very interesting, and there were a couple. So Teeter has five doctors, which work closely with the patients, and they also have a couple of technicians in the back. Um, there was also a few interns there. There was one who's doing it through Career Tech Center, and then myself through Semtech, and another one that was doing it as a residency. Um, so that was really cool. We went through safety instructions because some of the machines we were working with were not exactly much safe, like belt sanders, um, what else was there? There were bandsaw, stuff like that. We didn't use those too much, so that was good. Um, then we had to learn different processes, which I really enjoyed because there's a ton of stuff happening in the back. There's a bunch of really strange machines that you don't see on a daily basis, like cast saws and vacuum tubes, which were really cool. Um, so one of the things I started doing when I first got there was doing shoe lifts and repairing shoe lifts. And so if you look right here, you take a shoe and you'd have to sand it down to get rid of the tread on the bottom. And then we'd pick a foam that was specified by the doctor because there's different um, like strengths of the foam. There's soft foam or hard foam, just depending on what the patient wants and what the doctor prescribes. So we choose the foam. Then we have to glue it on there, which um, this was a shoe lift repair, so only this side over here needed to be repaired. Um, because that was already worn down when you walk, you kind of slide your foot, and so that got worn down on the shoe, so we had to repair that. Um, so we glue it on, it kind of goes on like this, but then there's a bunch of excess material that is left on the shoe. So we have to go take it to the belt sanders, and you can actually see right here, kind of where that white line is, um, is where it got filled in. The repair. So you can imagine if you didn't have that there walking around, it would be kind of uneven and very uncomfortable. And so you can see again, right here is where it's been repaired. So then, is that, oh, how do I go forward on the top? Oh, there we go. So then, by the end of my internship, I started learning new processes like pulling AFOs and molding FOs. An AFO is an ankle foot orthotic, and an FO is a foot orthotic. There's also KFOs, which is a knee ankle foot orthotic. Um, but those are the main ones I got to work on, so that was kind of cool. I started learning how to mold plaster because that's a really big thing um, when it comes to creating prosthetics, is being able to get an accurate mold of what the patient's body parts are like, so that was kind of cool. In this case, I started working on my own projects, which is also very interesting to me because I create a more personal connection with my project. So this was my feet. I was making a pair of orthotics for myself, and so I mold my feet inside of this I mean, they call it cloud foam. It's just basically a very soft foam, and when you step on it, it molds your feet. Then you would create the plaster and pour it in there. And then when it comes out, it comes out super jaggy and rough. Um, so you have to like wet sand it and basically smooth it all out before it goes in these vacuum. I don't know what you call it. It's kind of just a vacuum sealer. So that's what I can put it. But we choose the material. So in this case, it was the blue stuff. It's just like a fun color. But underneath that, there is. Uh, Thermocore, which is the type of cork that they use in the majority of the orthotics. Uh, you glue it on there, put it in the vacuum sealer, and then it basically presses it down, and you're left with a foot orthotic. It kind of comes out really rough jaggeds, and you have to take it to the belt sander, sand it all down, make it look pretty. Um, so that was what the majority of my internship was made up of, uh, and it was really interesting to me because I never really got to work that hands on with something like that, so that's cool. Um, some interesting, like, fun facts about the future career information is that the technician salary is usually around 45 to 55 um, in America. However, I guess in our area, that is a lot higher. So the doctor's salary is actually usually what the technicians are making, and the doctors are making a lot more than that. Which was kind of interesting here that in our area, everything's higher. Um, to be a technician, you only need a high school diploma. So the majority of what you learn to do is on-the-job experience which I never really thought about, but it was very interesting to see. Um, and doctors, of course, need a master's degree, and you go to school, you complete a one-year residency, which is what the one girl that was there doing an internship, or residency, was doing. And she had to tell me more about her college experience with it, and it was kind of cool. So that was really interesting for me as well. Um, and then I would like to acknowledge my supervisor and mentor, Rob. He never gave me his last name. It's a little funny about that, but his name's Rob. Um, David Marshall, he helped me set up the entire internship, and that was really nice of him. And then Mr. Barron for providing me with all like, the necessary materials, uh, teaching us stuff in class, all that good stuff. And then all the other teeter employees for being there 
and really making the experience fun. And yeah, any questions? Hi, I'm Anna Paul, and this is my Simon Tech uh, internship presentation. Uh, I did my internship at Core Health and Wellness, which is a chiropractic office downtown. Um, before going in, I spent time researching the business, as well as chiropractors in Michigan, and the whole like uh, wellness idea. Um, uh, the staff at Core Health and Wellness was uh, really amazing. Canada's secretary was starting working there right around the same time that I started my internship, so I got to learn um, everything about the office as she was as well. And then the doctor at the practice is Dr. Cadeau, and he's a super awesome guy. He's really great for like, all of his clients and everything. Um, they were very excited to have me as an intern, and they made my experience, like, really nice. They were super welcoming, and, like, they were my first, uh, I think this was my first place that I called, and they were like, oh, yeah, we're just going to find a spot for you to intern. Um, so that was really sweet of them. Um, I spent time learning a lot of different topics with Dr. Pudo. He helped me understand like the purification process with like supplements, um, which cleans out your system and everything. And I got to know about like spine function and um, uh, what chiropractors do and the tools they use. Um, I got to spend him spend time making what well, sorry. I got to spend time watching Dr. Pido uh, make adjustments on people um, during the day normally during the morning, and then if I wasn't, like, spending time um, learning with him or, like, watching the adjustments, I was with um, Kim in the office, and when I was with her, that was normally during the end of the day, and I did a lot of filing and, like, um, learning how to schedule people, meeting clients and everything. Um, we spent time, like, setting up files on the computer, organizing documents on paper, and then, like, scanning them or shutting them. And then one of the biggest takeaways that I got from this experience was my overall knowledge of, like, the wellness um, idea and spinal function. Uh, it has uh, shown me a new possible career that I actually uh, considered because I really enjoyed the internship. And then it taught me a lot of good, like, problem-solving skills and time management skills. Um, so a day in my life, um, normally I would have to get up at, like, 6 to get there at 7 because they open up really early. And I would spend, normally, my mornings with Dr. Kudo, and then I'd have lunch, and then I'd come back after and spend time in the office with Kim, or do like cleaning around the office, and then my favorite parts um, were I really liked getting to like know the patients and um, meeting them, and then I also really liked getting to know uh, Kim and Dr. Pido. they were really nice and I got like I spent 45 hours with them so I got to like know them really well. And then also learning about purification, I thought it was really cool um, to see like how it worked and get like well explained to me. And my least favorite part were people who weren't like very nice to uh, camera Dr. Cadeau. And I'd like to thank Dr. Cadeau and Cam for the amazing opportunity and then Mr. Brand for being a great supervisor. And that's all. All right, hi everyone, I'm George Parvel. Uh, I'm a senior this year in the Science Tech Group, and I completed my Science Tech internship at um, Promethean, which is an engineering firm here in town that focuses on uh, human-scaled climate control technology. And some of the forms that they implement that in are uh, transportation, they use um, their heating systems and their seats, um, furniture, and 
They're working on implementing in garments currently. So those are three of the main applications of the ADP. Um, so how the process works is, um, at its core, is a therm thermoelectric device which um, creates exothermic or endothermic reactions using semiconductors. And um, it's supplied with a current to create a thermal reaction um, right here with the positive and negative wires. Um, and when the polarity of the voltage is reversed, um, the effect switches from heating or cooling or endothermic and exothermic. So um, it's a very versatile system with using these like um, different types of semiconductors to um, be a versatile solution for heating and cooling. Um, so this is what the actual module was um, comprised of. It, it was called the engine by the, the workers at Promethean, and it's basically comprised of, um, under here is a heat sink block, which is used to um, transfer any potential like current away from, or heat from the current away, and then um, stacked on top of that, you can't really see it here, but it's the semiconductor device, so that um, supplies the actual exothermic or endothermic reaction. And then on top of that is a heat transfer block, which is, you can't really see it here. Um, and then finally, these strips are made of graphene, which is a pretty revolutionary material, and it's, um, it's carbon-based and it's extremely conductive. It's um, more conductive than copper or any other um, mainstream conductor, so it's really efficient in these heating and cooling systems. Um, these are some examples of how the products are implemented in, for example, this is a club car that was um, retrofit with the product, and although you can't see it, under these seats would be those graphene strips and the semiconductor um, engine, as they call it. And here's an example of a seat which was um, obtained from Naughty, is the company, it's a boat company, and this is in the process of retrofitting um, one of the devices, and then that prototype will be delivered to, to Nautique and they'll um, develop a professional system to implement it in their product. So the engine would be cut out, the space would be cut out right here, and then the fabric would be recovered on the seat, and then it would be sent off to them. And some examples of projects which have been completed by Promethean are um, the Polaris Slingshot, which is popular here in town, I think the resort can rent them, and then the Indian Motorcycle. Uh, these are some of the components and some of my tasks at Promethean. So I was in charge of um, disassembling the modules which didn't work or were faulty. So here are the heat sink blocks, here are the heat transfer blocks right here. Um, and I was responsible for basically working on recycling those parts and um, experimenting with different fixtures such as um, this, which is like a way to actually manufacture the parts and the product. So here's another part of the uh, product, I guess you could say. They, they come in kits with, um, this is just a motherboard to control the current flow and basically the electrical components. Um, this is a dummy board, as they say, because it hasn't been programmed yet. So I got to keep one of these, otherwise I probably wouldn't probably be in jail right now if I stole one of these with the code on it because they have a copy, right? Um, so <laughs> these are some of the components they use in their products that are commonly used in electronic um, products. And then there's that same image of um, a work in progress uh, prototype model for um, one of the seats that they use. And here's some various wired in their supply. Just uh, all to facilitate the product, the process of making the product. Um, so some acknowledgments I'd like to make are to my hosts for my internship, including Bill Myers, who's the CEO of Permedian, uh, Chris Hardy, John Dreher, Jordan Colvin, Chuck Couchy, Dave Waters, Zach Kruger, and others. Additionally, I'd like to thank Mr. Barron for facilitating this internship process and Mr. Fortney for providing the basis of my knowledge of this topic. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Grant.
Newhart, and I did my summer internship at Skilled Manufacturing Incorporated in their aerospace engineering division. Uh, let me talk a little bit about Skilled Manufacturing. Skilled Manufacturing specializes in manufacturing airframe and components for the private industry, commercial airlines, and the defense industry. Uh, SMI prides themselves on the quality of their products. Uh, my first day on the job, I had to go through an hour-long safety orientation on what to do when, if there was a chemical spill, or if the machine stopped working, or if the machine broke. Um, SMI also has a very strict COVID policy. Uh, all unvaccinated uh, employees had to wear masks, and uh, when you got to work, you had to go through a room that, where a computer took your temperature, and if your temperature is too high, you wouldn't be allowed to work. Uh, one of my main activities while at SMI was inventory. Uh, it wasn't the most fun, probably my least favorite part, uh, but it's necessary for the success of a company. Uh, each, each individual component or part had to go through around 11 steps, and uh, it just shows the quality of their products. I mean, 11 steps, and each part had to be signed and scanned through a computer just in case if a part failed. Um, then if a company was sued, they could prove that all parts went through perfectly. Um, one of the main jobs in inventory was creating um, those bags of uh, tools and parts to make uh, that air intake section in an uh, engine or private jet. Uh, it, it was not fun. I worked with Kimberly. It was my least favorite part of the internship. Um, it's, it's necessary, though. It's completely necessary for the success of a company. Um, the next main job I did at SMI was time study, where I timed how long each machine took to make a part. And um, what I would do is, in the far, or the far machine to the right, when that light turned yellow, I'd press start on the timer, and that's downtime on the machine, which means it wasn't running, and an employee or an engineer had to come and um, do work on the part. After I took the time for that, and I each machine took around four hours to run with around two hours of downtime. So after I timed all that, I got together with my supervisor, and we put it all into Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, and we determined the average downtime for each machine, and each machine we did around three time studies for. Then after we found the average downtime, we tried to um, uh, figure out ways to improve, or to decrease downtime and improve how many parts each machine can put out, and therefore SMI would be able to take on larger contracts and make more money. Uh, each, each engineer ran around four different machines, so most of the time it's downtime is because the engineer is working on a different machine or they were on lunch break. Um, after, after we talked about it for a while, we decided uh, that it's just best to keep one engineer with four different machines because if we increase the number of engineers, we'd have to increase how much we pay them, so it's an extra $70,000 in salary just to increase parts by a little bit so it wasn't worth it. Um, the next main part of my internship was power flushing. Uh, power flushing ventilator parts, which is weird because I was working in an aerospace uh, engineering company. But during COVID, uh, they couldn't produce airplane parts because there was no need for them. So they changed from uh, airplane parts to ventilator parts because that's what they needed to do. It just shows the um, uh, how well the engineering um, industry can adapt to changes. Uh, so with this, I put my hands into those um, rubber gloves, and then took a power power flushing kind of like a um, power washing tool, and would shoot water through each of those holes to help um, smooth out micro grooves that were um, uh, faults that was made during production. And um, after uh, during production, and then um, sandblasted through those holes as well to help smooth them out. So when we shipped them to the company that was making the ventilators, they wouldn't have any issues when creating them. Um, my acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Mr. Barron for uh, helping me get everything set up and getting me all the necessary documents to um, help work on the shop floor. Uh, Kimberly from Inventory uh, for making Inventory fun and um, uh, letting me know how important it is for the success of a company. And Mr. Greenman for providing me with an opportunity to learn more about a field which I'm interested in studying. Uh, any questions? Hello and good morning everyone. My name is Maddie Lutowski and today I'm going to be telling you guys about my internship. 
Over the summer, I was fortunate enough to be able to intern with Dr. Nathan March at West Front Primary Care. Um, West Front Primary Care is a family practice, and it is the type of place you would go if you need a checkup or a physical or if you're just feeling sick. So Dr. March is a doctor of osteopathic medicine, um, which is slightly different from an MD, which is just a doctor of medicine. Both types of doctors go through about the same amount of schooling and have the same credentials um, in the United States, the same standards. Osteopathic doctors take more of a holistic approach, uh, meaning they take the whole body into account and they focus more on preventative uh, methods when treating a patient, uh, whereas MDs are more traditional and tend to treat the patient with medicine and surgery when an issue occurs. So one of my favorite parts of the internship, I'm going to see which yeah, okay, so in this, in this picture, this is what the doctor's doing. It's called um, osteopathic manipulative treatment, and it's basically when the doctor um, manipulates the body to move the patient's joints and muscles, um, and this helps like treat the patients, and it was used for many different things during my week internship. All right, so another thing I noticed um, was the increased use of technology in the office. So when I was younger, going to the doctor's office, I remember the doctor mostly wrote everything down, um, everything I was saying. Um, but during the week, Dr. March took most of his notes on the computer, um, and he also held a couple appointments over a video call. Um, well, I'm sure the shift has been occurring for quite some time now. I think that it has increased because of the pandemic. And I found it interesting and impressive how much information the doctors could gain um, from one simple call and just listening to what the patients had to say. There was a couple times when the doctor um, would call the patient in for another appointment or more tests, but most of the time he could just get everything from that virtual call. All right. Um, another thing I found interesting was the doctor's use of acronyms. Um, the first thing I learned during my internship was the structure for the notes the doctors take. Um, so doctors use SOAP to remember everything they have to cover during an appointment. So SOAP stands for Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan. And Subjective is the part of the notes that is completed by the patients when they first arrive, and it is all their medical information and what they have to say about their problems and why they're, why they're having an appointment that day. Objective is everything the doctor and the nurse observe when they're in talking to the patient. Um, it could be qualitative and quantitative observations, such as blood pressure, heart rate, or just something they notice. And then the assessment is what the doctor diagnoses the patient with, what he says the problem is, and the plan is how they plan to treat the patient. All right. Um, so there were many parts of the internship I enjoyed, and others that were a little bit more repetitive. So I interned during August 2nd through the 6th, so there were a lot of physicals and yearly checkups at that point because a lot of kids were going back to school, sports and stuff. Um, so those were very repetitive, and Dr. March did mostly the same thing. He would go in and introduce himself the same way and ask the same questions, just to make sure he didn't miss anything. Um, those weren't my favorite, but there were a couple more interesting appointments I got to watch. Um, I watched skin tag removals. Um, I watched cast be put on and removed. I watched warts be frozen off, which was, that actually happened quite a bit. <laughs> um, yeah. So, there's many more things I could have talked about during this small presentation, um, but these were the most memorable and important things I learned. And I would like to thank Dr. March 
uh, who I shadowed for the majority of the time, and also Dr. Songer, who I shadowed with for one day. Um, I thought it was very interesting to see the different ways doctors worked, the different ways they interacted with their patients. Um, and I would not have had this opportunity without the both of them or the rest of the staff at West Front Primary Care. So, appreciation for that. Um, so hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Samantha Hinkle and I completed my internship at the University of Louisville Hospital in Kentucky. I shadowed my best friend's mom, Amy Walkup, who's worked in the hospital for over the course of 15 years in many different positions, but her current one is an administrative assistant for surgical services. Um, but because my internship is a little different, I shadowed multiple roles, so I didn't only see her position. I saw lots of doctors while I was there. Some of them were orthopedic surgeons, anesthesiologists, pharmacists, neurosurgeons, scrub techs, and more. I wanted to see as much as I could while I was there. So a normal day in the life for us would include waking up at 4.45 in the morning and arriving at the hospital around 6.30 to eat breakfast um, because of the hour commute from Amy's house. Next, we would go to her desk and work on administrative tasks like answering phones, scheduling meetings, filling out spreadsheets and paperwork. I'll show examples of these on the next slide. Um, she would then check the operating room schedule and find a room for me with the most interesting cases and nicest staff to welcome me. University of Louisville is a learning hospital though, so there were many med students and other shadows I saw during my trip. Um, I definitely wasn't the only student there. Um, some days I would go around to multiple rooms and experience many different cases in one day, but other times I would stay in one room from start to finish of the surgery. They lasted hours and it was surprisingly exhausting to be standing all day, so it was always a relief when it was lunchtime. We would take around 30 minutes um, and then go back to Amy's desk. Depending on the day, we would either plan meetings for surgeons or attend them at this point. Then I would be sent into new ORs to observe more. My tasks in the ORs were very limited for obvious reasons, but I got to do things like tying surgeons, surgical gowns, turning on their headlights, locating materials, plugging machines in, and more. Lots of these tasks were ones that none of the surgeons could do because they were in the sterile field. Um, and while they sound very simple, I'm still surprised I was able to be involved in the process at all. Um, and then we would leave around 3.30 or 4, depending on if we had meetings to attend or not. So this is me and Amy on the first day when I got to change into scrubs. And I was really excited about it. Um, and then these are examples of this presentation. It's just an, an OR summary, so I don't know why I don't know if I get um, But it has basic information like um, cancellations, number of cases that they had in each OR. Um, so these would generally be presented to surgeons during meetings or things like that um, so they can improve their performance. Um, then here's an example of and meet some meeting minutes that Amy has to take. So there are just general announcements and an overview. This isn't the meeting that I attended because I did get to go to a meeting with all the surgeons, but that one was about robot cases and she didn't have it completed. So this is from July 2021 instead of August. Um, all right, so my biggest takeaways um, was learning that there's a lot more that goes into a hospital than I previously thought. Um, because I was lucky enough to observe multiple positions, I got the chance to see different, perspective, different perspectives of the hospital, and I was surprised by the number of people involved in their responsibilities they each have. Especially during COVID, the hospital was completely overwhelmed. Um, in that picture there, you can see the white tent. They had to resort to using multiple tents as waiting rooms because they turned the regular waiting room into space for more patient beds just because of the insane number of people who are in need right now. Um, this has made me more confident than I was before about my desire to study medicine and help others. Um, a general piece of advice I received from most doctors while I was at the hospital was that I should be an anesthesiologist. So this is something new that I'm considering, maybe because of their reasonable hours, level of pay, and lifestyle they're able to maintain while doing a highly demanding job. I feel especially grateful to have had this internship opportunity because it directly relates to the area I would like to study in the future. Although I'm not sure if surgery is what I'd like to pursue, I learned about many different positions while I was there, and I think there's something in the medical field that would be a good fit for me. 
This experience proved to me that I would really enjoy the atmosphere of the hospital and the direct applications of math, science, and technology. For example, from this picture, you can see the machines lining the operating room. Technology is obviously a vital aspect of hospitals. Um, specifically for anesthesiologists, they use tools like pulse oximeters, infusion pumps, ultrasounds, and gas analyzers that monitor the patient's vitals while they're under. Um, math is also used to calculate the dosage for each patient um, specific to their size, allergies, weight, and other factors. They also have to closely watch the numbers on the machines that measure things like oxygen saturation, heart rate, and blood pressure. One of my favorite parts during this trip was making new friends at the hospital. I really liked everyone I met, and I had so much fun spending time with them and learning. Um, in the top picture, that is the best scout tech in the hospital, Nolan, and he was really kind and welcoming to me. And then in the bottom picture, that was one of the residents who I met while I was observing a, I believe it was a hysterectomy in that picture, um, and his name is Adam. Um, so my favorite surgery that I shouted was definitely the open hysterectomy because I watched it from start to finish and I got to see everything really well because I was standing by the anesthesiologist and that's when I got to meet a med student named Ty who told me about his experiences and explained everything that was going on in the surgery which was really helpful because a lot of times it was hard to follow. Um, they removed a woman's tumor from her right ovary and it was about the size of a football. Some of the staff said that that was the biggest one they've ever seen, and they let me see it after they take it out in the middle. Um, I didn't have many parts about this trip that I didn't like, but waking up that early was definitely an adjustment, and going to bed at like nine was an adjustment for me also. But I uh, also watched this tooth extraction surgery that wasn't my favorite because it's just kind of boring and straightforward compared to the other cases I saw. Um, I would like to thank Amy Walkup and the U of L hospital staff who welcomed me so generously, as well as Mr. Barron and the Science Tech Program for encouraging this opportunity. Are there any questions? Yes, Lily. What was your favorite position? Um, I really liked probably the gynecologist the most because that those are the cases I got to watch the most. Um, but the anesthesiologists were also really interesting because I had this woman who explained like all the machines and she was just very nice. Thank you. Yes. She lost like 20 pounds from the tumor. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam. Uh, I did my internship at Inland Seas. So it's a local nonprofit that's based in Suns Bay. It's all about connecting people to the Great Lakes by providing educational opportunities. Um, the programs that they offer are all conducted on tall ships, like the one in the picture there, and they cover biology, ecosystems, engineering, and other topics. Um, we took a field trip with Inland Seas our freshman year where we collected water samples and was, were able to uh, view like microorganisms under microscopes. It's a really cool program. So they have their engineering program, which is centered around operating and building underwater ROVs. So students are given a box of PVC pipes and fittings, some pool noodle segments, an ROV kit, and instructions to make something that can drive. It's a lot harder than it looks. You have to be collaborative and work with the resources you have to make something that's functional. And they're also given a number of different tasks to complete, like gathering objects from the surface of the water or using a magnet to get metal objects, steering through and around obstacles. So up in the upper left, that's 
a picture of the materials that you use, and that was my well, that right there is my first attempt of making a ROV, and it just took a lot of revisions until I was able to make it drive. There I was just steering my uh, vehicle around a buoy, which is fun. And I did all of this on my last day of the internship. That was the fun part. My tasks were repairing the ROV kits. So they had seven kits and four of them were broken. Each kit consisted of a control box, which had three switches that moved both directions, it was a double pull, double throw switch, and they connected to three motors. Each switch had a corresponding motor. Um, a lot of what I started off doing was problem solving. So I had to test resistance throughout the switches, tested voltage throughout the circuits, and just keep problem solving to find the issues because I wasn't given a lot of information. Um, so yeah, one kit needed a broken, had a broken fuse and a bent propeller, so I replaced the fuse. One kit needed all three motors replaced. One needed two of them, and the other one was waterlogged. So one of the kits was a different model, so I had to remove the circuit board and do a lot of work on that kit. So I started by assembling the motors. I had to, they came in packages that included these materials, I had to assemble the propellers and then put the propellers under the motors. And then a lot of what I did was just preparing the kits for um, repair. So I started by removing electrical tape and solder from the existing um, connections. Then I actually had to learn how to solder. I had never soldered before. So I spent some time just getting used to using the solder iron. Uh, further preparation included finding out which um, wires went to which switches. So I ran a few tests with the multimeter. Thanks, Mr. Porton. And now I was on to the majority of my internship was soldering new motors onto these kits. So. Um, first you have to make sure this T was on the either side of your uh, connection. This side went to the control box, this side went to the motors. So you had to make sure the T was on and the T would tighten around the wires and make sure that there wasn't any tension with on the solders themselves. And you had to put on the shrink wrap before you could do anything else. And then once that was on, you could make the solder. I then put a line of hot glue on, and then uh, use a heat gun to shrink the shrink wrap over the hot glue so it would be waterproof. And my biggest challenge was the puffer fish. So the puffer fish was a different model than the rest of them. The rest are angelfish, and the pufferfish is designed for like elementary school use, so it's a lot simpler and it had a circuit board. So I had to remove the circuit board and basically rewire the entire thing to match with the more advanced angelfish model. And this took a lot of tries. It wasn't very easy, so kept screwing up. I had a lot of cramped solders, but I eventually got it to work, and then fuses started to blow. So I got more fuses, found out it was a problem with the motors, and replaced all the motors. So, yeah. Um, I would like to thank my advisor, Jillian Votava, who helped me throughout my internship, and the Discovery Center for allowing workspace. 
and Mr. Barron and Mr. Fortin for helping me through my assignment tech year. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my presentation. Today, I'll be talking about my internship at Common Good Bakery. So, a little bit of background about my internship. Uh, Common Good actually began as my backup option. Uh, I was originally planning to work at Forefront with the analyst there uh, because I might uh, I like to be a financial analyst uh, for my job. Uh, but it felt clear because they wanted me to work more hours than I was able to. Uh, so I had to intern at Common Good. And I chose to intern here for multiple reasons. Uh, I like to bake, and I know the owner, uh, Jason Gallen, and his son Hayden. And I like to learn a little bit more about uh, running the business. Uh, so, at Common Good, like I said, I like to make, but unable, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that much. I really just, the only thing I did was uh, help with croissants a little bit. Uh, however, I was able to see uh, kind of the process of bread making there and kind of their schedule. Uh, I did mostly just small tasks around the bakery. Uh, I hung kush over uh, the racks and Cooch just covers the bread while it's proofing. Uh, I cleaned the flour out of the baskets after they've been used. I uh, bagged baguette sticks and made them. I made and cut eggs into little squares for sandwiches. I uh, shredded cheese. I uh, made salads. I also did things such as washing dishes, putting together boxes, scooping cookies, and uh, other things. So connection with school or future study. Uh, obviously, it'll help if I want to run a bakery, a bakery in the future, or if I just want to work at a bakery. And it'll also help if I want to own any sort of business in the future. And it'll help with if I want to uh, do something with finance or business. Uh, so, some key learnings and takeaways. I uh, learned how bakery is ran, uh, kind of the process. And schedules and everything, and I kind of learned just how the business should be ran in general. I learned how important customer service is, especially for a food service uh, business, and how it's important to be nice to the customers uh, to ensure uh, business. I also learned the importance of teamwork and communication, uh, which are necessary to get things done effectively and efficiently. And I also learned a little bit about the financial side of running the bakery. Uh, so some of my favorite and least favorite parts, I like the flexibility that they gave me. Uh, they kind of let me work when I was able to. And they helped me get my 45 hours in uh, before the end of the summer. And I also learned, uh, like being able to work at a bakery. Uh, so it's kind of like what I like to do. And Something that some things that I didn't really like all that well. Uh, I was kind of disappointed that I didn't get to bake a whole lot. Um, I was kind of disappointed as well that I didn't really get to do much on the financial side. So I was hoping to do a little bit more. Uh, so I'd thank uh, Jason Gallen, the owner of Tom Good, uh, for letting me intern there. I'd like to thank Matt and Diana, who were my main supervisors and helped me out a lot. Uh, and told me what I needed to do and everything. And I'd like to thank everyone at Come Good, full staff, for uh, helping me and being very nice and generous. And I'd also like to thank Mr. Barron for uh, helping me with any questions I had about the internship requirements and everything. Uh, any questions? Are there any differences between baking at home and in a commercial bakery? Uh, so, yeah, so obviously commercial bakery is much bigger quantities. Uh, but the <coughs> I, the idea and the, I guess the main process is the same, but it's pretty similar. Uh, it's just uh, more time consuming, obviously. You have to have commercial equipment to work with that much dough. Main process is pretty simple. Yeah. What are your goals for baking? Uh, so, I don't, so I'd like to own a bakery, but 
but I don't think that's just not, I don't think that'd be a very good idea from a financial standpoint, at least not for now. So maybe I'd like to just continue to bake from home, obviously, but maybe in the future, uh, when I have, you know, a good amount of money saved up, and maybe I might possibly like to open a bakery. Uh, what is your favorite item to bake? Uh, I mean, I bake mostly bread. Any kind of bread? Uh, I like sourdough. Always open to samples. <laughs> Alright, any other questions? Alright, great. Thank you, Scott. mystery sample on it to find the uh, 
the, the exact amount. And so I did I created all this data um, and I did it twice to make sure um, so I can like compare the two to see how much I messed up. And so the mystery sample was a mixture of these two, uh, 750 and 500, which gives you an average of 625. And what I added was actually 626, which was a, you know, 100% to success rate, which I was pretty proud of. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a great experience. I, it definitely opened my eyes to the idea of biomedical engineering. Um, one of the things I was surprised was just how much reading it is. Um, but it was actually quite enjoyable because it was interesting. Um, but yeah, I'd like to thank Tanner Schmidt for bringing me in. And then also his PhD student, this is Paige. I didn't actually get to meet her. Um, this was a picture was taken a while ago. This is Adam, super nice, friendly. Uh, helped me when I need it. And then Nikhil, less nice, but very, very smart. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Any questions? Yes, Alex? Did you uh, figure out the mystery protein? So, it, you know, mystery, it was just a, like a combination of two that we already knew. Um, so this is basically just testing to see how well I could, like, hide that liquid. Um, but, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Right. Howdy, everyone. Um, your comments. This is my presentation of my Samatai Gary internship. Tell you that Gary Stainless. Uh, so, why Gary Stainless? So, uh, I ended up choosing Greg Stainless to do the internship as they had curated design as you know, the forefront of their uh, you know, skills and stuff, which I acquired thanks to. Uh, Two smacks with Mr. Barron as a freshman and a sophomore, where we would learn the basics of Autodesk Inventor. And to my luck, Greg Sands also used Autodesk Inventor, so that's pretty helpful and pretty useful. Uh, for those of you who don't know, their Greg Sands is a stainless steel fabrication plant in Power City, specialized in custom stainless steel products. Uh, they also do other stuff involving copper, aluminum, brass, bronze, copper, brass layers that I'm trading right now. Um, and with, you know, besides the uh, perfect fit for my uh, skills, those also like to know that we employ in the shop which help with the transition. All right, so this is what normal, my normal day was like. Some exceptions, I'll cover those later. Uh, I started at 7 a.m. and with the first two hours chatting with an engineer, uh, primer for their special inventor techniques. Uh, interestingly enough, it seemed like each engineer I worked with did something different, uh, which is surprising. Uh, for example, half of them used the uh, 3D like modeling mouse, which is like some high-tech thingamajig that lets you like, instead of holding your middle mouse button to rotate the 3D model views, you can uh, like you know, move it around. But some of them like used it, some of them didn't, and uh, that was interesting. Uh, and, and so basically, for the first two hours, I just you know shadow learn techniques, and then at 9 a.m. had the engineering team meeting, uh, where we basically like, covered all the projects that we had on the whiteboard, and uh, like see like what's up on track, stuff wasn't, we're waiting for parts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and you know when it comes to like what projects that we, we worked on, it was a, a wide variety. Um, they ranged from like mass order of medical cabinets, uh, so much muscle, I think. Uh, to like custom exotic kitchen designed for a mansion in upstate New York, and even an embalming station. Oh yes, uh, I think the kitchen was like uh, it was like a multi-room kitchen with uh, like one and a half million dollar price tag, so pretty expensive. And like in fact, like one, one of the ranges that we had to use, like like a good range or whatever, cost so like twelve grand, so pretty expensive. Uh, when it comes to the embalming station, that was pretty cool. Uh, this little thing you go here calls a trocar well. You like jam into the uh, dead body, suck all the fluids. So I got that, make that. That was pretty nifty. Um, <laughs> kind of weird, but you know, it was a, 
And apparently it works, so, you know, I'm not going to question it. Uh, it's pretty gross. Whatever. Um, so, anyways, what was unique about Grove Stainless was their uh, relationship between the engineers and the fabricators on the shop floor. So basically, like, as an engineer, we would, we would always go out and check on our projects, you know, get feedback from, like, the fabricators, like, hey, like, you, like, you're, um, uh, like, you're missing, like, a flange here or whatever, and, uh, like, like so because some things that, like, should work together on the, uh, like, we design, like, hat, what well, looks like it's going to work, but in actual life, it just doesn't, because the tolerances are off or whatever. So, it was nice to, like, go out there and check on our projects and, like, see stuff that we're actually making on the screen come to life in real time. Um, the most impressive, like, thing in the shop was the, uh, I'm not trying to pronounce that, it's an Italian laser cutter. It's like, I think it was 15 million, so really expensive. Uh, it's, well, they, they call it the most valuable employee because it basically is, it, it's like the heart of the shop. Uh, it cuts uh, the steel and, like, it, it, it can cut a football field, like, well, it's not that big, but, like, it, like, it can cut a football field's worth of stuff in around 30 minutes. It's like, it's ridiculous. Uh, I think it, it, it costs 20 times as fast as their old, like, Mitsubishi laser cutter. So it's uh, pretty cool. Um, and so besides, I just played it most of the time. But I also had some experience with uh, CNC, which is, uh, see a video over there of the CNC machine working. Uh, so great stainless, they also do metal, they also do wood as well. And um, the CNC machine basically has, uh, it's got the, uh, Windows PC, which controls the uh, machine, and then you've got the iPad used to see the patterns that you're putting onto the machine, because the PC just doesn't render them for some whatever reason. Uh, so basically, you can you can pick out the pattern on the iPad, that sends it over Bluetooth to the PC, and the PC sends it to that thing. So you, like, oh, you saw the video, but it, uh, what that image was, or the, the flat pattern on the iPad, was exactly what's cut on that thing. It does it very quickly. And it also has like a vacuum on it, which wasn't working for some reason when I was doing this. But usually, those waste sharings get you know sucked up into the vacuum. Uh, and then stem connections. So basically, uh, it was very cool to actually be able to like I could understand most of the things that were going on, even though I've only taken a couple semesters of Inventor or CAD design. You guys are juniors, I think. So you guys did this last year. Um, like you know, like it's very similar. Like the only difference is between the uh, 3D modeling that we did and the uh, sheet metal and inventor is like, you use uh, these uh, little flanges that are, because uh, you, know, you can't bend metal at 90 degree angles, you have to like add a corner onto them to improve the strength. So, but for more or less like, like what we did with Mr. Barrett and Pat is extremely similar to what we, uh, you know, for designing like, you know, projects. So it's, uh, it's like what we, we learned in sophomore year is uh, very, very useful. And it can actually, you know, get you a job without having to go to college. So that's uh, pretty nice. Uh, I have to thank my intro coordinator, Laura Larkingman. I can't find a photo of her because her photo wasn't up on the, their website. But yeah, she uh, helped me basically for almost everything. I also have to thank uh, Michael LeBron, the president of Braille Stainless, because he welcomed me into his shop and uh, helped me find a placement when I was uh, struggling. Uh, being in the summer to actually find somewhere to work. And I also like to thank. Uh, ben, Todd, Brad, Skylar, Rick, Tim, Janet, and Kirk, who I all shadowed over the course of my internship because they provided a lot of knowledge, and uh, hopefully I can apply that later when I, uh, you know, get a job eventually. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yeah, Alex. What's your favorite part? Uh, pro <laughs> the pro car. Well, the embalming stage. That was pretty cool. You know, it's a, uh, you know, it was very nifty. It was a, uh, it's pretty weird, but you know, it's uh, it was kind of cool at the same time. Yeah. Anybody else? No. All right. Cool. Uh, my name is Alexander Maxwell, and over the summer I did an internship at Twenty Five. Um, quoting, I mean, they're from 20 Fathoms, it's like quoting from their website, a tech startup incubator and a co-working space and offers programs for health and tech startups and technology professionals. So basically they um, have
have, it's an open workspace where anyone can come in and rent a desk for a period of time, or they also, you know, help tech startups and give them spaces to work and funds. Uh, at 20 Fathoms, I worked under Mr. Keith Kelly, who is the program manager of TC Codes and TC Cyber, which are organizations that promote growth in the field of growth and cooperation uh, in coding communities and cybersecurity communities in Traverse City. And he's also a professor at NSC and has been teaching there for several years in software development. Um, most days I was there from like 2 to 5, just because I had other stuff going on at the moment. Or not at the moment, at that time. But I had my own desk where I, I kept all my projects that I could come back to every day. Um, overall, my project was to set up, you know, the, I don't know if you can see the IoT greenhouse logo, but they're um, little plexiglass greenhouses that are connected to Raspberry Pi, which are little computers. That are, they use them for teaching Linux and Python in nonprofit courses. I'm pretty sure actually Simon Tech has a couple of them somewhere. Oh, I got a bunch of them. Yeah. So, if you ever need someone to set them up, I know how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I went through with, I think it was 16 different Raspberry Pi greenhouses, and I had to make sure they all worked and update all the software and all of them. And there were a couple I just had to completely set up from the beginning. Just quite a bit tedious, but um, like, yeah, and they also did quite a bit of label making because they were implementing a new system of monitors to, so they could use the Raspberry Pis, so had to make sure no one used the wrong monitor with the wrong keyboard or anything like that. Um, and then I also did some working through example lessons, like lessons that hadn't been used in a couple years. They just had to make sure we're still, you know, accurate with the new operating systems. Um, and a couple other things about just the workplace environment. The although, although there were like many people in the office space, the team at Twenty Fathoms is only about like five people, so it's very small. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to observe like weekly group meetings and see how they're, you know, how they each had their own role, which was, and they um, all shared. And like a spreadsheet, a tab in a spreadsheet with what they were doing that week and who they were reaching out to for funds because they're a nonprofit. Yeah, that was very interesting. Um, here's some examples on this side and the next of a couple of things that I did. The, on the left is um, an example of like what a sample lesson might look like for this course, and it's just setting up setting up the greenhouse and giving it a name. And so it will tell you what the temperature inside the greenhouse is. And then um, on this page, on the left, is uh, some of the administrative work I did in setting up the operating system. So there was an admin account. They could control, uh, they could they, if they control what the account the student would use, so the student couldn't lock themselves out of the computer. And then on the right is a picture of the greenhouse setup with the Raspberry Pi connected to the monitor. Um, okay. Kind of some, like, I, okay, sorry. Um, overall, I would say this experience has given me a lot of insights into what I want, like, what kind of a job I might like to go into. I don't think that um, the job my supervisor did would be specifically for me just because he spent a lot of his days on the phone negotiating with people, but I, overall I really enjoyed the rest of the experience with um, learning, working in, I learned about GitHub and working in Python and Linux as I mentioned before, but um, yeah, as some of you likely know, I am planning and majoring in computer science and data science depending on which school I'm applying to, different ones at different schools. Uh, I'm particularly interested in AI and machine learning, which wasn't really explored in this in like what my experience is in this internship. But it, what I learned is a lot of will help me with the, some of the foundational steps, which I'm continuing to learn in other courses at NMC this year. And I'd like to thank Mr. Kelly for being my supervisor and guiding me through basically every step of the process. 
I'd also like to thank Mr. Chris Bozio for connecting me to several local tech companies, as well as Mr. Barron for providing assistance through the whole thing. That's it. Anyone have questions? So what classes are you taking, or have you taken at NMC? Um, I took AP Computer Science A last year online, and this year I'm taking Relational Databases where I'm learning SQL, and a Scripting and Automation course where I'm learning Python. Is that the one where you build a robot? Uh, no. No. All right. I think that's a robotics, that's a robotics course. Okay. Actually, I think Mr. Kelly teaches it. Yeah. Cool. And Ms. Oh. Howard had a question. Oh. I did have a question. How big are the greenhouses? They were uh, maybe like about, I would say the base is probably about the size of like my computer. Okay. So not very big. Just little practice things. So like they have sensors so if it gets hot you can turn on a fan or... And open, open the roof. And that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So cool things to program with. Thank you. Inland Seas Education Association, which you've probably heard of, but it is a nonprofit organization with the focus of providing learners of all ages with hands on experiences and educational opportunities through like their school ship program. They have a deep sea, not deep sea, but a deep ship program where they go deeper and do different experiments and collect different data. Uh, it was founded in 1989 by Captain Thomas Michael Kelly and John Elder for those reasons, and to this day it has continued to grow and provide educational experiences. Uh, I did data entry and analysis, which doesn't sound that exciting, but it's actually very helpful. Like, it made it so that Jillian, the, my supervisor, she didn't have to do the data entry, and I learned about secchi depth, like the different surface temperatures, different temperatures at like 50 to 60 feet deep. And I also did like visualizations of this data. Uh, so it makes it like easier for the public to interpret and stuff like that. But I used field scope which is relatively new, and Inland Seas is like its main tester, kind of. So I got to kind of like shape, like what I did was feedback for FieldScope to make it easier for people to use it in the future. Uh, this right here is just like the sheet that I had to look at. There are like a lot of those. Um, took me at least 20 hours to enter all the data. And I just, there's a lot of data on these sheets, but the only data that I would enter is the date, time, latitude and longitude, second depth, and water temperature. So you just have to kind of like look for on the sheet where stuff is, and then enter it into FieldScope. This is, there were a, this is like everything that I entered, just a little sample of it. So I did secchi depth, which is like how clear the water is. Um, water temperature at, like I said, 50, 60 feet deep. It's usually how deep they went. They couldn't always get it exact. Um, I also did surface water temperature. So just the surface water temperature at like whenever they stopped and has anybody been on a school ship? Okay, so you know like where they stop and do different stations and stuff? The surface temperature they take at like every station. So they use this data to like look, well I'll just show you the vis visualizations, but all of the data that's collected on those field trips is used by Inlancies to kind of like predict what may happen in the future and look at stuff that's happened in the past. So this one right here is, well, 
Okay, so uh, after I entered all the data, I got to like play around for the rest of my internship with the visualizations. And the ones that I did mostly focused on water temperature. So this one right here is just water temperature over time over the last year. So that's most of the data that I entered. Um, this one up here is a second up with temperature. There's not an obvious, well, there's correlation, but it's not super obvious. Um, the average water temperature of Sutton's Bay is 12.17 degrees Celsius, at least in the past year. That's not including past data. And then the map shows all of the different surface temperatures in all of the different locations that they have done so far. So usually they, a lot of the data was just from the Sutton's Bay area and like Grand Traverse Bay, but they, over the summer they also went down to Detroit and they went up to the UP. They did different areas. So they got more data and Jillian was very excited about that. So um, here's more visualizations. I tried to screenshot because the entire visualization includes all of these on like one page, but I couldn't get that to fit, so I just doing each one separately. Uh, this one right here doesn't really have much to do with surface temperature, just shows how much data they've collected over time. As you can see, like with COVID, it kind of went down, and then they also, but then they started going up again because it's outside, so there's less restrictions. And they also started doing their own, like they started going off down to Detroit and stuff. And then this one over here, each line is a different ship. So I don't remember which one's which, but each one's a different ship. So like, I think this one is the school ship. So this one is the one that students and stuff go on. So that shows all of the temperature data that has been collected. And then Jillian also did a bunch of other visualizations, and so these are just some examples. Uh, Sutton's Bay is where they take most of their data from, but they also do wetlands, like right outside. There was like two pages of data from that that just started doing it, so that was really easy for me. But just some of the visualizations. And then connections. I want to be a marine biologist in the future, likely, not positive. But this internship was very beneficial for me because data entry is a large part of being a marine biologist. You have to like collect the data, enter the data, and then analyze it. So that's basically what I did. Um, so I would like to thank Jillian for providing me with the internship and Inland Seas, because that's where I did my internship, and FieldScope, because they made the data entry a lot easier than it could have been. So, yeah. Any questions? uses it for like many different reasons. And they also entered other data, but I just did Seki depth and surface temperature. So it kind of shows the impact that climate change has had on the Great Lakes. What is Seki depth? Seki depth is like the clearness of the water. Like that's where they put the disc down and then it's how far you can see it. Ah, very interesting. And so, I'm oh, sorry. And what types of uh, charts were those that you're making with the boxes? Uh, there was a histogram right here. Uh -huh. Histogram. And then map box 
cats and whisker charts. So what are those? Um, so right here you have the median. Now this is the first quartile, third quartile, and then the minimum and maximum. And it shows that for each of the months. Cool. I just want to make sure that that is okay. So you know what's in it there. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, so. Any other questions? Ms. Howard? Can you go back to the slide that had like the map on it? Yeah. Okay. So when you said the average water temperature in Sense Bay is 12.17, what's that in here, Mike? Ooh.
rod is slid in to the slot and is stood up here on this peg. And these cleats that need to be welded onto the, the rod are slid into these holes and are tack welded um, to be uh, to stay in place. And then the rod and cleats are taken and finished. Um, here's what I did for part two. I also created these screws. So I created the cleat placement screw, uh, horizontal rod placement screw, and the vertical rod resting screw. This guy over here, I did not make all thanks to McMaster Carr for um, their design here. This is the threaded stub bumper, which goes on the underside of this guy to make it not slide during the manufacturing process. Um, so my connections, uh, during my internship I used the program uh, SolidWorks, which is very, very similar to the uh, program we used here in, in, uh, in school, in uh, Autodesk Inventor. Um, thank you, Mr. Um, I also used a lot of the skills I learned in Symantec uh, measurement and instrumentation with Mr. Fortin. I had to use uh, a lot of calipers and angle devices to create my base plate and my screws at proper angles to fit this, to fit the cleats. Um, I, uh, yeah, one second. All right, favorite and not so favorite parts. The internship and the job itself was very, very hands-on. I got to work with the product every day. I had my own station. Um, I had my own computer, and I worked independently most of the time. Uh, the job itself would be is made to help doctors, and the product is helping doctors. Um, so that felt really, really good. The not so favorite part, um, I got there usually at around. 6.45 every morning, and I worked till around 3.45 to 4 o'clock. So pretty early, pretty long hours, and I did not personally um, go to any cadaver labs, but uh, the job itself of being a mechanical engineer with a uh, biomedical application of this sort would be um, they, they need to go to cadaver labs to test the products that they create. And I, I, again, I did not do this, but that is, um, I'm glad I did. It's, it's not what I want to do. Um, so finally, a special thanks to Thompson for helping me um, on my internship and letting me intern there, especially to Mr. Steve Nowak for mentoring me and overseeing my internship and uh, teaching me uh, everything I needed to know. And um, a very special personal thanks to Mr. Barron and Mr. Gordon uh, for teaching me the skills I needed to prerequisite this, and also Mr. Barron for putting this internship all together and helping me along the way. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Ms. Howard. All right. So you mentioned that you're maybe not interested in mechanical engineer with a biomedical emphasis. So what type of, it sounds like engineer, are you hoping to become in the future? I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I wouldn't like to be a biomedical engineer. I, I just don't want to look at cadavers. <laughs> Scott. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Howard. How long was your internship? It was 45 hours spread apart, um, spread the entire summer, uh, usually every Friday. Um, yep. Any other questions? Engineering place where um, basically they just 
um, that they didn't, I didn't really see much of the engineering there, but they helped to make the parts for specific aerospace, um, like rockets, I don't know what rockets, but like airplanes and stuff. And they, um, and they just make it, they like just ship the parts to private industries where they um, actually, like they actually like put the parts in place. So some of the tech, the a lot of the the aerospace parts were made through the machines. Like there's probably about like 50 machines at the place. Um, each machine had their own individual function to make specific parts. Um, each machine they like um, was pretty hot, so each machine had this coolant in it to help prevent the parts from being destroyed. Um, and then there's also specific technology that was used to help make sure the parts were, were um, uh, they were safe to be used in aerospace because aerospace and um, aerospace industry needs to be pretty exact in order to function without malfunctions and danger to society. So there is some of the technology that was used was this um, this thing this. It's over here. This was um, a calibrator that measured the exact measurements of specific parts using a ruby coated measuring thing, and it was almost perfectly exact, like the nearest thousand millimeter. And one of my jobs was, I, was, I had to do a time study for specific parts. So I would measure the amount of time it would take for each each part had like five or six different steps in order to be made. Like one of the parts was, one of the steps was this over here. This was the deburring step that the workers there had to take a part in and um, usually, usually would just measure how long each specific step would take and the total amount of time it would take to make a part like this. Usually a small part. Um, honestly, it was kind of like one of probably one of the most boring steps or more boring jobs I had. Like it was just basically timing stuff for an hour at a time. So I mean, it was it was useful. They they really found it useful because it um it would if you with the time studies they were able to make sure they were being efficient with their parts. But you know it, was, it probably wasn't something that I enjoyed that much. This was this step was sandblasting, which was a little bit more enjoyable. Um, so basically, this part right here was already made through the machines, but there's two. Uh, so these two holes right here weren't necessarily um, the, the machines weren't able to completely drill through them all. So the sandblasting machine right here, I would have to put like hundreds of these parts, not at a time, but hundreds of parts. In like the span of a few hours, I would put them into the machine, and I would um, have to use the sandblaster thing that was up here. I, you can't see it because it's kind of um, dark in there, but it would spray sand and drill through these holes, or blast through these holes, and make it this part useful for the aerospace. And then the last job I had that was pretty big was inventory. So I would, the, the skilled manufacturing has thousands of parts at a time. So I would have to, you, I would have to, um, these, all these crates right here have like hundreds of parts in them each, and like right here. And so I would have to use these specific sheets right here, and I would have to make sure that um, each, each of these bags would be shipped off to another site and they would all have the exact number of parts in, that are needed for most, I don't know, some specific aerospace tasks or something for, for um, the next site after a skill manufacturing. So they would ship these bags off, and I would, be, I would be the one who had to make sure that each bag had the exact number of parts for the next buyer. And then some of the other stuff that were important in the internship. So 
they really pride themselves on safety, and it was kind of not because it was kind of necessary by OSHA standards to have safety glasses. So at all times, I would have to be wearing safety glasses, and every every person there would have to be wearing safety glasses. And they had other safety measures that I would have to follow in order to make, maintain a safe environment for all the workers. And then some other stuff about just the internship in general was, I mean, norm, for a normal person working this kind of job, they would have hours from like 6.30 to 3.30, but since I was the intern, they didn't, they didn't really have much. They had a lot of leeway of how I work, so usually I'd work four hour days from like 8 to 12, like any day of the week they were fine with. And um, also, there was a lot of breaks going on, so there was like usually like 15 minute breaks, so usually the workers were able to like go into the break room and just take a break you know, for buy some vending machine stuff. And then, so my application to the future, for my future, I kind of want to go into some sort of engineering field. And while I didn't really like actually like, get to take part in all very much engineering stuff at the place. I was still able, still able to talk to a bunch of the engineers that were there and get some insight on what kind of a job they have to work and all the stuff. I was able to look at some of the stuff that they do. And I think this, I, this, these are some of the engineers at the place that they were. Um, I didn't get to like work with them in the 45 hours that I had, but I was able to see some of the the applications that they had, for, because they were the ones who were designing the parts that would go into the machines. And I was able to see kind of what future I would hold as an engineer. <laughs> Some I, I'd like to acknowledge Gary Greenman, who is um, based my supervisor for the internship. He, he's, also, he's also a director of engineering there. And Randy Rhodes, who, gave, who is the one who offered me the internship. And then I'd also like to acknowledge all, the, there's probably like 50 workers who work there, and I usually each day would work with someone different, so I just want to acknowledge all the workers who were there who helped me out through my internship. And I'd also like to thank Mr. Barron for offering me this internship. That's about it. So I interned at City Bike Shop, which is a bike shop. I was under um, the owner, Hunter Gardner, and when he wasn't there, I was under his wife, Maggie, who is a co-owner. Um, so yeah, we used, I was more of like, I was a salesperson, and also I was learning how to inventory the different products that we sold, because that's part of what the owner does, is that they have to inventory each item so that we can find it. We used the system Lightspeed, which is the point of sale system. It helped to manage our inventory and it's also where we did sales through. It's sort of a more, um, I guess, upcoming system. It brings together a lot of different like computers and tablets to make sales easier. We had a tablet that we had to walk around with and scan each serial number to make sure that we had the same amount of products that we have in our system out on the floor. Um, it made it a lot easier than having to run around and scan something and then run back to the computer to make sure that it scanned if you could just like walk around and carry it. So that was what was nice about Lightspeed. Um, so for inventory and sales, I had to categorize each item individually. They were categorized by like the overarching category, which like was like the brand and what it was used for. And then you had to narrow it down into the smallest category you could. So if you had like a part, like a chain, you had to put it under parts, then you'd go into the chain, then you'd go into what speed it was, like if it was a 10 speed or 11 speed, and what type of bike it would be used for, like whether or not it was a kid's bike or an adult bike. Um, I had to find the different products from our B2B sites to import into Lightspeed for the different products. If we ordered a new product, you had to go to the page of where you were ordering it from, find the ID, product ID, and input it into Lightspeed. Lightspeed has um, different uh, catalogs on it that would search in there for what the product ID correlated with for the product. 
and then I would have to input what our retail price was, like what we got the product from, and then the MSRP price, and calculate the profit we made off the product. So if we had like an $8, we got it for $8, and then you're selling it for $12, we have um, about $4 that we're profiting from. So it was, I don't know the percentage, maybe like 20 to 40 percent they generally ranged from. Um, yeah. And then when I was out on the sales floor, it was uh, pretty fun sometimes. Sometimes you get like Karen's, but uh, you had to have knowledge in like pitching and persuasion, which required a lot of research about different products. I did a lot of research on helmets because they released a new MIPS protection system, which slows down your rotational velocity when you crash, and then you're less likely to get a concussion. Um, so we had a new study that was a research paper by Virginia Tech that had gone through all of the different helmets and rated them from one to five stars on how likely you were to get a concussion. Five stars was least likely to get a concussion. And I had to go through that and then convert meters, meters per second, which is what they had in the research paper, to miles per hour, because most people who are riding a bike do not ride in meters per second. Um, and then I read multiple articles on that, and then also different products that we should be getting. Like, uh, Gooder glasses are very common glasses that everybody uses, but we don't have them at the shop. So I did some research to persuade Hunter to get some that we could use. And then E13 and Garmin products were some of the other ones that I researched to help our sales increase. And our B2B stores are where we got our products from. We have J&B, which was just like a different parts suppliers. So they had anything from the parts of the bike to like bike belts, fenders, different things like that. H2 was another one just like that, and Shimano was as well, but Shimano was more parts based on bike parts. Um, and then of course we have our actual bike producers, so Giant Scott and Niner are what we supply. Giant is the overarching um, producer. Every single bike goes through Giant before coming out. And so that makes the Scott and the Niners a little bit more expensive since Giant has to get a share of their sales. Um, and then from the different um, producer sites, I also had to file different warranties for if we had broken products that were broken when they arrived or, are, or were broken within the warranty time limit. Um, you just went to the tab called warranty and then had to research what the product was. If it was an older product, you'd have to go and look back in the history to see whether or not they still produce the product. Um, we had someone bring in a wheel that they broke and the wheel was very old. So we had to figure out what the time period it was from, what a new wheel would be, and uh, tell them the new price of what it would be to replace the wheel. Um, so yeah, and then I would like to thank Hunter and Maggie for um, letting me intern under them, and they gave us barbecues every Saturday, so that was pretty cool. Uh, any questions? Yes, Ms. Howard? You mentioned MIPS, Movement of Persuasion. What are those? MIPS is the, it's a new technology. It's, um, I don't remember quite what it stands for, but it, you look inside a helmet, and it's this like carbon fiber sort of netting inside of it. And it's like sort of attached so when you crash, the, your brain isn't like spinning around. Instead, it's like slowing it down. Oh. Yeah, it's very fancy. If you'd like the numbers, I have the numbers. No, I do love some that. <laughs> I, um, if you hit a tree, just like normally, Eight miles per hour um, is where you'll get a concussion, uh, or you could get a concussion, uh, or not eight, 15 miles per hour. And then with the mix, it takes it down to eight, and then with Virginia Tech's five-star rating, it takes it down to seven. So, yeah, pretty cool. So, 
this is the multi-directional impact protection system. Ah, okay. So I think it allows, if you put your helmet on, you can rotate the top a little bit. Yeah. I think that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that your brain isn't doing that rotation. So when I crash, I, after maybe 20 years, I finally got a new helmet, so I did upgrade. Cool. Other questions? Yes, Ms. Howard? Is this a type of internship that could be turned into like a paid job for either next summer or into the future? Yes, it could. Um, they did, I ended up doing a job after interning, and then they said that if I would like to, I could do it next year as well. It's not, like personally, I found inventorying everything kind of like very boring, so it's not my favorite thing to do, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. How do they find that job? How hard do you have to get a tree to get it in touch? Um, it's not people, don't worry. It's, <laughs> you have like, um, you know, you've seen like the car crash dummies? Yeah. Yeah, it's like that except for biking. So at Virginia Tech, um, if you find the research paper, it has pictures of like a mannequin's head with the, uh, Helmet on, and then they were just like whacking them at different speeds. <laughs> yeah. I want that job. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Ms. Howard? Where are you planning to go from here with this internship under your belt? Um, I don't. I think I don't think I'm gonna really go into business. Um, it wasn't my favorite thing to do. I do. I did enjoy like working there because I liked the people and everything. Um, but personally, I think it helped with my people skills a lot, so I'm planning on going into some sort of psychology. You can't really intern in that because of patient confidentiality, but I think it would help being in business helps you have the people skills needed to communicate with different patients. Okay, so I'm Malia, and during the summer I interned as an environmental laboratory technician at SOS Analytical. So, SOS Analytical is an environmental chemistry laboratory that offers soil and water testing, and they work with private clients such as schools and businesses, but then they also work with the local government, and they do testing for public beaches. So, during my time there, I worked with biochemical oxygen demand samples, and biochemical oxygen demand is the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water that is needed to decompose organic matter. And so to do this, wait, is this Oh, so we had bottles like this, and they were 300 milliliters. And so to start off, we would put nitrate inhibitor into each bottle. And then after that, two specific bottles, we had to put seed, which is the type of bacteria that consumes the organic matter. And in relation to that, we had to prepare dilution water, which had BOD nutrients, which consisted of magnesium sulfate, calcium chlorate, ferric chloride, and phosphate buffer. And that was important because it helps the bacteria to grow. And in addition to that, we had to make sure that before we used the samples, they were within the pH range of 6.5 and 7.5. So then, Going, and then the ones that we added the seed to, we also had to add glucose, glutamic acid to provide accuracy. And so then going forward for the dilutions, each um, location had different dilutions. And I'm not really sure what determined the different dilutions. They just had a chart that said what to do. And so I would add that amount of sample to the correct bottles and then we would top it off so it would be 300 milliliters with the dilution water. And then after that, we would measure the dissolved oxygen with the dissolved oxygen probe right here, and this would be connected to a pH meter. So kind of similar to this, just not with that part. And so after we, so when we did that, we would then write down what the dissolved oxygen was, and we would make sure to put a stopper on the boss to seal them and cap them, and then we would incubate them for five days before we measured them again. 
And so it's a different process to calculate the VOD. So it is based off of the amount of dissolved oxygen, but I was not a part of the calculations to determine that. And so, and then another thing I did while I was there was coliform water samples. And so coliform is a type of bacteria. And during this process, it was very important to change gloves as to not cross-contaminate samples. And so, uh, Okay, and so also you couldn't touch like the inside of the bottle, or the rim of the bottle, or the inside of the cap. And so during this process, we used this thing called CalAlert, which detects both coliform and E. coli. And so we would dissolve one capsule of CalAlert in each sample and leave it for 24 hours. And then after 24 hours, so here's an example of CalAlert. So when it was initially dissolved, it would be clear, but then after 24 hours, some samples would still be clear, which means that there was no coliform in it, and so therefore no E. coli. But then some of them turned yellow, which means that it was positive for coliform. But just because it had coliform did not mean that there's E. coli in it. And so to test that, we would fluoresce it under uh, black light. So if it fluoresced under black light, it had E. coli. And if it did not, it was only coliform. And so then we'd have to take note of that. And then in some cases, we didn't do this as often because there's a longer wait time, but we would use color share, which essentially does the same thing, but there's a more definitive color change to it. And so when it was still salt, it would be yellow, but then if there was coliform, it would turn magenta, so it was a lot easier to identify. And then it would also fluoresce like before. And then during this, I also prepared quantitrays, which are these things right here. And so we would set the bacteria in the same way with CalAlert, and we would pour the contents into the tray and then seal them and wait the amount of time. But then the difference is here that they have like all these wells. So here's the large wells and the small wells. And there's 48 of each. And so that was important because then when we would fluoresce them, or like shine them under black light, we would count the number of small and large wells that fluoresce. And then we would use that to determine the concentration uh, or predict the concentration of bacteria in a 100 milliliter sample using the most probable number table. So what we would do is if there were like, for example, if there were like 24 large wells and four small wells, you would go down and find the number that aligned with those, and that would be the predicted amount of bacteria for a 100 milliliter sample. And then some other responsibilities I did that were not, or some other things I did that were not really specific to my job was just cleaning glassware. That was sort of something that everyone did. Oh, what do we do? Yes. Okay. And then I also did some filing of old reports, and it was important to pay attention to dates so to make sure that they were all in the right spot. And then also, I disposed of old samples, and for the samples, we had to wait for a certain amount of time before we could discard them. I don't remember how long. I want to say it was around three months, and so then we would dump them into a bucket and pour sodium hydroxide in it to like, neutralize it, and then we would discard it appropriately. And then also I assembled low-level mercury kits for the Environmental Protection Agency. And low-level mercury kits just consist, a kit has to have two bottle, or two yeah, small glass bottles for the contaminated water and two with non-contaminated water. So for this, my job was just to fill the two bottles with the non-contaminated deionized water. And then, the applications to science, math, and technology, it was important to know basic chemistry concepts. There was probably some more things that are important under chemistry, but for what I did, I only really need to know basic things, such as like rounding for significant figures and how to measure things properly and just using equipment. Um, for calculations, I didn't do a lot of calculations, but one that I did do was for calibrating the pH probe for the BOD samples, we had to multiply the barometric pressure by 24.5 and divide by 100. And then we would round the three sig figs and then set the pH meter to that. And then they showed me this, but I also didn't do it. But there was also, um, it was important to be able to use 
graphing applications for samples and just be able to chart things. And then my key takeaways were laboratory etiquette. So it's very important to wear the proper clothing when in that environment. And it's also important to like keep things organized and to be able to collaborate with others because even though not everyone was doing the same thing, they still kind of there was crossover in between different parts of the work that they did. So it's important to be able to connect. And then for communication again, like it's important because you're working for private clients and just the government in general, like the local government. And so because of that, it's important to not mess things up because it's a lot of work if you mess if you mess things up because then they have to take new samples. So even if it seems obvious, it's really important to ask for help if you're not 100% sure. And then for responsibility, you just need to make sure that you log samples in and out because if you're not organized, they'll lose them and that's a lot of trouble. And then also just to have, like, understand safety protocols and know where everything is. And then for acknowledgements, I would like to thank the SOS analytical team for helping me, but specifically I would like to thank Shanna Shea, who was my employer and helped me to meet all of my Cymatech requirements. And then I would also like to thank Cindy Gerard, who helped me to get my internship. She helped me with fill out paperwork and contact the people that I need to contact for it. And then Hannah Ennis, who is the actual lab technician, who I shadowed during my time there. So is this something you feel that you'll be able to use going forward? Like, what kind of study or career are you looking at? Is this um, I don't think I would want to specifically go into environmental chemistry because I didn't, I found the process interesting, but I just didn't find the overall concept to be super exciting. But I think I'll still be able to use it because I want to go into some laboratory job because right now I want to go into medical research or to and like vaccine development and so I still need to use the skills that I got from there so like laboratory etiquette and organization and all that. Questions? Oh, all right, thank you. Thank you. On stage, I did my internship at Quantum Sales. So Quantum is a major resource for sailors all over the world. Uh, the main thing they do is just make and design sales. Uh, they make sales for everyone, pretty much, from like we have our very own high school sailing team uses Quantum Sales, all the way to like world-class sailors. Um, and then Quantum also designs graphics for sales. That's something that I worked on a lot with. And then sometimes they also design boat graphics, like you see in the bottom picture there. Uh, and Quantum also has a lot of resources on their website for both new and old sailors about like learning to sail and race. So Quantum is a global company. Uh, the headquarters is right here in Traverse City though, but they don't actually make sales in Traverse City right now. Um, they haven't in about 10 years. That's mainly because uh, most people are buying sales over in Europe. There's a lot bigger market there. Um, and so when people do buy sales in the United States, they're often made in Europe and then shipped over here. Sales are made in like different sections instead of like one big piece of cloth. And so they're cut over in Europe. They ship them here and then places like the Traverse City Loft sews them together. Uh, I didn't get to work on that just because of like Michigan manufacturing laws. But I was able to oversee a lot of that like making the sales. Um, so I can't talk about like the specific details of the projects I worked on because I did a lot of stuff with like sensitive data and stuff that hasn't been like released to the public yet. So I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement for that. Um, but I did spend lots of time on, they call it the nesting program, which is used to make like configurations of different cloth pieces, which are then cut by the laser cutter. Um, the lasers in that picture right there. The nesting program has like a space that represents the table where the cloth pieces would be nested. And then I had everything in the table, um, I had to like configure it in a way that 
I would be using as little fabric as possible so that we wouldn't waste anything. Uh, I also had to clean the laser two times. That involves like refilling the tank with clean water, and then you have to allow it to like travel through the laser until all debris is removed. That whole process takes about an hour, and then you have to like check and make sure that everything's working and wipe down a lot of like the different mirrors and stuff. So it's very like in depth just to clean the laser. Uh, I also spent a lot of time compiling data from different sail cloth manufacturers to examine um, and determine like what fabric types were best for different boats. And so I did that, um, I used like the data in a program that mimicked different wind conditions and I would measure how much like the fabric stretched and deformed. Um, so the majority of my time was spent using technology to test the data when I was um, finding which fabrics would work best in different wind conditions. And then I also used technology for the nesting program to cut materials with the laser. Uh, I also had a lot of different calculations for the data because cloth manufacturers had minimal information and I had to calculate that missing information so that I could put it into the program. Um, and so I'd like to thank Libby Tomlinson and Ann Pearsall. They're the ones that really helped me organize my inter internship and found the projects for me to do. And then also, John, I don't know how to pronounce John's last name, but him and Sean McDowell kind of guided me through my projects and they were always there for me if I had questions on anything. You know that I do. Yeah. What was your favorite part? Um, I liked working with the laser, that was really cool. It's like nothing I've ever done before, so it was cool to learn that. And then also I guess I got to learn like a lot more about how sales work when I was using that program to test the different wind conditions. Because like I'm on the sailing team and like I feel like I'm pretty good at sailing, but I never really knew I guess about how they work in depth.